Thank you. Thank you. To have your attention, we'll get started. I'd like to call this meeting of uh, this January 23rd of the School Board San Bernardino School District in order. And we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Mackenzie, I know you're here. Is that your grandpa? I've known him a long time. Okay, are we ready? Here we go. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Could you stay here one second, Mr. Schneider? So up here? Is that okay to come up here? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. And we've got to give her one of these two. Thank you so much for being here tonight. So Mackenzie is um, a second grader at Bakey School, and she's brave to be here by herself um, to do the pledge, something that we do at school every day, right? Right. So what prompted me to have her come tonight from Bakey to represent our school was Right before um, the holidays, when it was starting to get cold, and it's really been cold the last few days, it feels like it's a heat wave right now outside. But she came with this idea that she felt like there were families or, or kids in particular that needed coats and they may not have a nice warm coat for the winter that was starting to arrive. So she kind of talked, as, as I understand it, with her mom at home about her idea to even use some of her own money possibly to go out and find coats that she could then donate to families that were in need. Um, so she and mom talked, and um, without having to use her own money, they figured out a way that they actually collected, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, 16 coats wow. um, on her own. She was able to then donate um, <coughs> through our school to help families that are in need. So I thought that was a really special project, something she initiated on her own, and I thought she needed some recognition, and this was a great place to do that. <clears throat> okay, it's a great way to start a meeting right there. Minutes? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. That's unanimous. Communications. The manifest is working its way around. It's over here. Somewhere. Resignations. Yes, we have uh, uh, one resignation. Uh, Joellen Gargley, our Bakey Media Specialist, will be retiring. I don't know if that needs a motion or not to accept because... No, it's, it's not an early retirement. It's not the early or anything, so I think we're all set on that. The nomination is none. Superintendent's report. I believe there's a, a document here that needs to be circulated or, around. Uh, here. It's a warrant operating budget oversight and default budget to sign. So if everybody could just sign that, is that correct, Michelle? Yeah, that's the default budget document. Yep, the default budget document. Um, I just wanted to give everyone uh, an update that uh, I know I shared this a little bit uh, last, last time, but I, I do want to read this letter that I have received. Dear Superintendent Ambrose, it's my pleasure to notify you that your recent application to the Public School Infrastructure Fund, established in RSA 198, 15-Y, for the Sanborn Regional High School and DJ Bakey Elementary School Blue Light Warning System project, has been approved. Your award reflects 80% of the project costs not to exceed $48,000. By April 1st, 2019, you must complete your project and submit a request for payment or submit an extension. Forms can be found online at long internet address. If a request for payment or an extension request is not made by April 1st, your award will not will, uh, will be forfeited. We've already done the request for the extension just to be sure, but we're already all over getting this done. Um, more details on public school infrastructure process can also be found at the reference website. Says uh, from Frank Edelblue. So uh, thank you. I, I wanted to say that this, I, I have to say that uh, I just wanted to give credit where credit's due because it's important to recognize that uh, I was at a training with Dr. Green presenting about how to help kids that struggle with emotion and uh, um, I got a phone call in the middle of the, the keynote from uh, Don Briggs 
Don's like, I heard this money's coming free. You got to get right on it. So by the time I got off the phone with Don and called Michael Tremell, he already had the grant half filled out and it had opened up two hours before. So this is another example of how Mr. Tamell left us a parting present of $48,000. So I just wanted to publicly thank Don <laughs> and Mr. Tremell and also uh, Patty and Bob for all of their hard work and every member of our safety committee, which has been excellent. I do need um, to make sure that the, the board is... Uh, there's been some conversation about these blue lights being put in. So I just want to make sure the, the board knows, uh, you know, the facilities committee has talked about it. It's gone back to safety. It's gone back to facilities and finance and whatnot. And at this point, <coughs> we just want your permission to move forward with this work because it really would be very helpful to have. The blue light system is basically a light that flashes in the gym and uh, uh, music room and other areas like the automotive department in areas where children can't hear announcements. <coughs> so this system would allow us in the event of an emergency to have uh, a notification mechanism in an area in which students could not hear an announcement from the office. So I, I feel very strongly that this is important. The safety committee has totally approved it. And uh, I certainly would be happy to hear any comments from Mr. Baker, but I would like a motion to approve the installation of these so that we can move forward. The cost would be, um, it, it, the, this covers everything except for 20%, so it's a really good... Are we talking just Bakey and the high school? It is only Bakey and the high school. That's what the grant was for, and that's all that you'd be approving this evening. So Thank you, Jim. You want a motion to accept the grant first? I, I would like a motion to accept the grant and to do the work. Well, You can do two. Can be a second that's fine. Right. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Now, a motion to... Install it. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Thank you, everyone. We appreciate that very much. Um, I, I don't have a lot to report on the middle school process, except that I met again with administrators for two hours today. Uh, I have asked, I did want the board to be aware that uh, uh, we feel that after having some initial soft estimates for costs for work that we need to be done on the high school, I've asked Steve Riley to work with the, uh, with the contractor to find out what the cost would be to get some more defined costs before we present uh, any information. So I will be giving you an update and may need a motion and a vote at the next meeting. Um, uh, and I, was asked, I asked Steve if he could get that information and send it to the facilities and or finance committee. Uh, the reality is, is that in order to accommodate middle school students, there are a couple of adjustments that would be made, made to the high school facility. One is a, a bathroom, a boys and girls bathroom in the area that those students would be located. Another is a locker room for the middle school kids because the phys ed classes would be happening simultaneously. And another one is talking about uh, an office for the uh, guidance nurse and administration for the middle school kids. Now again, the, all that we want to do is get an accurate estimate so that we can figure out the feasibility of this work. We're not asking for um, um, anything more than, uh, in order for a, a company to give us a clear estimate, they need to, they have an expense on their part to do that level of work, to actually cost out the work. So I will bring you more information about that at the next meeting. I just wanted you to know that it's coming, right? Yes. These estimates are for our, an already completed design in specific locations, or what? What what we have done is uh, we. Well, let, let, I will talk to that at the next meeting. Sound good? Okay. Yep. I'm not asking for anything tonight. I'm just giving you a heads up that in, a, in another meeting, I'm going to be presenting a little bit of information because we will incur some small costs to get an accurate estimate of the facilities upgrades that would be needed. Um, I just wanted to also mention that, that uh, we recently purchased a significant... Uh, we, we've had some fantastic growth in teaching and learning as a result of the professional development that the district has provided over the last year. If you remember last year, I reduced the, we, I presented a budget that reduced teaching positions but also added some funds for special edu uh, for a professional development. And the board supported that, the BUDCOM supported that, and the community supported it. And I just wanted to report out that we have had tremendous feedback from teachers about the effectiveness of the professional development, and we've also had a lot of requests for more books for kids to read. Real books that, uh, 
that they can read in, in their classrooms um, based on the units that they're being taught. I'll talk about this in more detail at another update, but I just wanted to tell you that, that uh, again, I, I asked Mr. Tamell right before he left, and Patty Haynes, Dr. Haynes, worked with him as well. We purchased $13,000 worth of books for the middle school on grant funds that were allocated to us by the state through our work on the PACE project. So this was these books uh, provided a tremendous number of, of books aligned to the curriculum in grades 6 and 8, $13,000. So I just wanted to say that I'm very, very impressed by the work of our middle school staff and their willingness to make a sincere effort to inspire children to fall in love with reading. And they have, this is the third request for books this year by the eighth grade team. And we keep trying to send the money to the kids, and I wanted you to hear that this was grant funded. It's really exciting. Plus there's a substantial allotment in the budget, coming budget as well for that. Yes, sir, and that's why we asked for it. Every, what, what's happening is, what I always think of is I want people to learn about something, and, and if they buy into it, they're gonna ask for more. And that's a real litmus test as to whether or not something is working. And we're getting a lot of requests for level, what's called a level library for grade levels, which means that it's just right books for that age and the units that they're, they're, they're teaching. It's really exciting. So I, I am very grateful that there's more money for books in the budget. Um, this time I'm going to leave um, the committee reports for a second. And if you go to second page 8-1, Guest speaker George Edwards from the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. George, you want, and Patty, you want to introduce him? Good evening, everybody. Good evening, um, Mr. Chairperson, Mr. Ambrose, and members of the school board. I am very pleased to introduce to you tonight George Edwards, who is the director of the Commission on Public Schools at the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. He joined the Commission on Public Schools in 2009 after many years of service to schools in New Jersey and in New Hampshire. So he is one of our, one of our local folks. Um, he served as a social studies teacher, assistant principal, and principal. And he has the distinction of having opened two New Hampshire high schools as the founding principal. So he knows a lot about what we do here in the public school sector. Um, he earned his MED in administration and his bachelor's in social studies and education from Keene State College. We are welcoming him here tonight to speak to us about a new type of accreditation that NEASC is offering us, district accreditation. Um, previously, it was only accreditation by schools. So we're gonna be listening to Mr. Edwards tonight talk about district accreditation. And I would like you to help me in welcoming George Edwards. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the superintendent and the board for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, I have a few slides and um, a short video to show you. Um, and then uh, after my presentation, I welcome any questions that you have. Um, as Patrick said, I, uh, I, I really have the honor of um, being here tonight. And also, this, is, this has been a really nice day for me. I was saying earlier, I started my day in Robstown and I ended my day here. So whenever I can stay in New Hampshire uh, for a full day, uh, it's, a, it's a good day for me. Uh, I live in Concord and I travel down 93 every day. And those of you that know 93 you know, feel my own, I'm sure. <laughs> so. uh, what, I, what I wanted to do is uh, to just uh, give you a, a real high level overview of the accreditation process by talking about who we are, what we do, uh, why it's important, and then really trying to focus in on your district and the participation that your district has had in the accreditation process throughout the years <laughs> and how district accreditation would differ from your current involvement. So you can see a little bit about who we are. Um, we are a regional accrediting agency. We are a private nonprofit organization. Uh, we got our authority to accredit schools from the U.S. Department of Education. We are organized into uh, four different groups. So the group that uh, your schools and your district are associated with is the top one, the Commission on Public Schools. Uh, but we also have three other uh, groups within our organization. One that accredits um, institutions of higher education, one that accredits in international schools, and one that accredits independent schools. 
So our commission, the commission that, that you're associated with, uh, is um, led by a volunteer committee. Um, they're the ones that make all the decisions, and, and I'm actually, uh, I work for them. Uh, so um, they are a group of building administrators, central office administrators, classroom teachers, all practitioners, uh, and they're the ones who oversee the process and the standards and receive all of the reports from schools and approve those reports and provide feedback to schools on those reports. So there are six professional staff members, five in addition to myself, who uh, work for this commission and work for schools like yours, your district. Um, and um, we're all former principals and superintendents, so we you know, really have, I think, um, our finger on the pulse of what's going on in schools today. So right now we accredit uh, over 750, uh, 725 uh, member schools, and they have a lot of different uh, configurations. And I, I think it's interesting to hear um, uh, about the range of schools that we accredit. So uh, our smallest school is a small school that's located on an island off the coast of Maine. It's called North Haven Island, North Haven Community School. They have 68 students in grades K through 12. Um, and then our largest school, uh, is Brockton High School in Brockton, Massachusetts, uh, with about 4,000 students. Uh, so you can see there's a great disparity in the types of schools that we accredit, but they all are um, dedicated to school improvement and accountability, which is what brings us all together and is the common thread of accreditation. Uh, I, I, it was nice to be introduced as uh, a local guy um, because oftentimes when I go to districts, they say, What do you? folks from Massachusetts coming up here and telling us what we should be doing in our schools. But we're actually, as I said, a representative group. And right now we have six representatives from the state of New Hampshire that serve on that volunteer commission and uh, make the decisions about schools and their accreditation status. So you can see we have a, a wide range of folks on our commission that represents central office and building level administration as well as elementary, middle, and, and high schools. So if you don't mind, I just wanted to show you a, a brief um, video that, that kind of gets to the core of uh, what accreditation is all about, who we are, and, and what we do. So. When I came here, I sort of thought accreditation was kind of like a list and check off the boxes you passed and you're an accredited school, ta-da. But it's definitely a lot different than that. NEASA is a pretty far-reaching organization and so well-founded in what they're trying to help schools do. They're in partnership with you. They're in partnership with your school. They're in partnership with all schools. We don't think there's any such thing as a perfect school. Being a good school means always adapting to be better. We believe that all schools, no matter how good or great they are, they always should be improving. At NEAS, we provide accreditation services to schools and colleges throughout New England and around the world. Accreditation is about ensuring that schools are doing their very best on a daily basis to improve their practices. It's an ongoing relationship where the school commits to self-improvement, commits to a philosophy that they can always improve, and that we serve as an accrediting agency uh, in a capacity to assist them. For more than 100 years, this group has been visiting schools in the U.S. and for the last several decades overseas with this set of standards that has evolved over time. And some of those schools are some of the best known schools in the world. The main benefits, I think, of accreditation are it helps the school to look at its work through multiple lenses, through the instruction, which is the heart and soul of what we do, teaching, learning, assessment. The process starts with an internal reflection. The richness of the accreditation process is the school is looking at themselves based upon what it is they say in their mission they're trying to achieve. The very nature of education has to involve self-reflection. If it doesn't, there isn't growth. How often do we really find the time to slow down and to receive some really honest and caring feedback about what it is that we do. And it's not just about your school community, but it's about school communities all around. We're all in the business of educating kids. Teachers trust teachers. When you come in with accreditation, 
it's peer review. And that peer review lends itself to an honest discussion and dialogue between the visitors and the people at the school. It's about the conversations. It's about the people uh, talking to other people and learning through sharing. We are professional volunteers. We're people who do this for a living. We teach and coach. We're going to help another school do what it's trying to do. It's very much they're coming in, telling us what we do well, telling us what we need to work on, and then helping us to achieve that. And that's a lot more collaborative than I imagined that it would be. Even though we're known as an accredited school, we still need to work on it. There's a lot of power in getting that outside perspective or getting it, um, a new way of looking at things. It's really great to know that I'm a part of a school that really believes in its students. I like that my opinion is heard and that I see change. Is the school serving the students well? Are the students thriving? Are they developing? Are they growing? So we come back to that question always. There's a lot of value in choosing an accredited school. As a parent, I really want my child to be in an environment that models the same kinds of things that the faculty are asking the students to do. If you want to pick your school where you would like it to be, the best way to do that is to go through accreditation. I think all schools that go through the accreditation process end up being much stronger schools. The one thing that is important about accreditation is just a continuous process. We are able to engage in the kinds of conversations with schools that are more likely to lead to change, to transformation. I describe accreditation as a thread that is woven throughout the fabric of everything that schools and incentives do. Having an accreditation from the ESC is such an awesome opportunity for your school. So many things come out of it, professional development, programmatic changes, an excitement and an affirmation that you're doing a great job. The thing about the accreditation process is you see the experience in total. And there's maybe no other way that you do that. So what I want to do next is to um, just kind of talk a little bit about um, the components of accreditation. So really, you heard them talk about standards, and that's really where accreditation starts. It starts with a set of standards. Uh, those standards are developed by practitioners, and we go through a process of review and renewal of those standards about every five or six years to make sure that they really do represent best practices in schools. The next step after um, looking at those standards and trying to align your practices to those standards is this process of self-reflection. So giving a school an opportunity to look at themselves, to look at their practices against the lens of these standards to determine where their strengths are and where there are potential areas for growth. Next comes the peer review process, and uh, we uh, organize and, and we have about 65 visiting teams each year that go out to schools, and that's just our public school commission, um, that go out to schools and that uh, perform these peer review or decennial visits, as we call them, uh, for our schools. And one of the great things, not only do schools benefit from the visit and the feedback that they get, but oftentimes their teachers feel as though they benefit greatly from the experience of being on a visit with them. And I know that's how I got involved with the association back in 1989 when I first became a principal. Uh, I, I was invited to go on a visiting team and I felt that it was an excellent professional development opportunity for me personally and allowed me to bring ideas back to my school. And so I really tried to do a visit every year or two so that I could stay fresh. And it gave me an opportunity to go to other schools, which we don't often uh, have that opportunity in education. The, the last part of the process, or the last component, is this continuous improvement piece. And I, I really think that this is one of the most important parts because uh, we provide feedback to schools on the things that they're doing well and the things that they can improve on, but then we take it to the next step and we maintain contact with the schools and give them an opportunity to report back to us on the improvements that they're making and, and continue to provide them with feedback. Uh, so it's, it's not a one and done situation, it's a situation where we continue to work with schools to monitor their improvement and to provide them feedback throughout the course of their accreditation period. 
So a little bit about the why of accreditation. Um, it is a time-tested and proven process. Uh, we've been around for a very long time, uh, and we continue to update uh, the process and the standards to make sure that they really do um, reflect best practices in education. It is a research-based uh, process. Uh, the standards are research-based, and the process is research-based. Uh, and we've had uh, the program of evaluation validated um, through a uh, university uh, who did a research study on uh, accreditation and the, the, the validity of the accreditation process. One of the things uh, also that schools uh, really appreciate is having that independent third party impartial assessment. Uh, so, you know, I know oftentimes um, as a principal, I would be so close to some of the things that I was doing that having a third party, having another set of eyes was often helpful to help me see some of the needs that we had, but also to help me to uh, better appreciate some of the strengths that we had as a school. And then the, the, the final piece is uh, this idea of consistency across the continuum. So the, the fact that we uh, work with our colleagues uh, in higher education and the fact that we also get to interact on a regular basis with our colleagues that are working with international schools and independent schools really gives us the op opportunity to have access to a lot of great information uh, about education that we can then share with our members. So one of the interesting questions that uh, we get a lot is, um, you know, the, the state of New Hampshire, every state right now has some sort of accountability program, so, uh, you know, why do we need to go through accreditation? And uh, I, I thought this was uh, maybe a, a good illustration of the differences between the kinds of feedback that you receive from the state accountability uh, program and the kinds of feedback that you receive through the accreditation process. So I just took a snapshot from the state website, state DOE website, of um, a school, which I won't name, um, um, test results. And um, as you can see, um, you know, it gives you the, the percentage that, um, that scored at a certain level, but it doesn't really tell you very much about how you can take that information and apply it in an actionable way uh, to improve student achievement in the school. Whereas on the other hand, um, what we do in the accreditation process is um, that our visiting teams and our commission give targeted, specific uh, recommendations to schools uh, based on uh, the visits that they perform uh, and based on our standards. And so, you know, we really feel as though, although test scores have an important role in the accountability process, that accreditation provides just that much more information that can really help schools improve. So I wanted to, as I said, uh, mention a little bit about uh, your district and where you are now. Um, so right now, all four of the schools in your district are currently accredited. Um, but each one is accredited separately as a separate school. And so what we're now offering to schools is the opportunity for all schools to be accredited together as a district. Uh, so there are some really important differences um, and some important benefits for schools to go through a district accreditation rather than separate accreditations for each of their schools. One is that it really reinforces districts uh, to assess themselves and to use goals that are common. So having a common language, having con common standards, also having a common timetable. Because when schools in a district are accredited separately, there's no guarantee that they'll all go through the self-reflection and the accreditation visit process together. So it can really create a situation where schools are disjointed and one school is in a very different place than another school in the accreditation process. So it also gives schools the opportunity to um, examine the ways that they can support each other, um, and it really encourages a K-12 cohesion. Um, so philosophically and practically, you know, how do we create systems uh, in schools that really support each other 
and really uh, provide the, the best and the most seamless experience for our students as they go through the district. It also supports uh, articulation of curriculum from K to 12, um, so that again, there's a more seamless um, curriculum for students to experience as they go through uh, their, their school experience, their district experience. It reinforces district <coughs> initiatives and priorities, and our new process actually gives uh, districts uh, and schools the opportunity to identify some of their priority areas and make the uh, identification and the work in implementing those priorities a major part of the accreditation experience. And then finally, the uh, district accreditation approach reduces the time uh, and it also reduces the cost that a district would invest in the accreditation process. One of the areas that uh, we've included in our new accreditation process, and you have a copy of our new standards in front of you, uh, is this idea of a vision of the graduates. So, um, and this is something that districts have, have really embraced quite a bit. Uh, the idea of, you know, what would you like your district, your district's graduates to uh, know and be able to do by the time they graduate? Uh, and then what does that look like uh, at different grade levels or at different school levels throughout the district? Um, we define uh, the vision as having four components. It's uh, knowledge and understanding of that knowledge, uh, but in addition to that, uh, it's skill development and it's dispositions. So what, are, what do you want your graduates to look like? How can you help them get there? How do you know when they're there? And what does that look like at different levels throughout the schools uh, in your district? So um, I just want to finish up by talking a little bit about benefits to the school. I talked about district benefits, but from the school's perspective, um, it also it ensures that the school has the capacity to meet the educational needs of their students. Um, it provides schools and districts with a blueprint for the changes that are needed to make sure that you can meet the educational needs of your students. And as I mentioned already, that third-party validation is often really important to get another set of eyes to look at the important things that you've been doing and provide you with feedback on them. And then finally, just a little bit about uh, benefit to the community. So uh, not only does it uh, assist the district and the schools, but it also helps the community in that um, it really supports administrators and teachers as they work towards school improvement. It, it assures that students uh, to, to students, rather, that their schools are working to meet their uh, educational needs. For school boards, it affirms that your educational policies and the plans that you've established uh, for the district and for your schools uh, are guided by your community values and are also um, guided by best practices in education. And from the local citizenry's perspective, it assures uh, that tax dollars are being used to support not only a 21st century school program, but also a 21st century facility. So with that, I'm going to, uh, to end. Again, that was just meant to be a real high level overview, uh, but I'm happy to take any specific questions that you might have uh, now or in the future. Yeah? Um, Dan, mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit more about what the standards are, yep. uh, the area of focus? Sure. And if they're, you know, local, statewide, regional, national, how do you, how do you, if that, you know, determine the standards? Yep. So I'll start with the process that we use. Uh, we brought together a group of, it was about 20 people. Uh, they were all from New England. We had a couple of people from each of the six New England states. Um, they were principals, teachers, superintendents. Um, and they were the committee that actually formulated. They reviewed our previous uh, standards. Uh, they looked at current educational research. And then they revised the standards. And you have the book of revised standards in front of you. I, I, I'll be honest, one of the things that was really helpful to us is um, there's a gentleman um, whose name is Ken Marshall, he's from Massachusetts, and um, he's basically um, made his career uh, to look at educational research, to distill it to 
really manageable pieces and then to provide it to educators. And so we had Kim come in and work with us uh, and, and he really helped us to, to look at the research and to um, identify what research we should uh, include in here. So I'll just turn your attention real quick to the very first page if you open up this booklet. We have five standards for accreditation um, and you can see them here. The first one is, is learning culture and we define that as the thing that promotes shared values and responsibilities in achieving the school's vision. Okay, so, so schools have to have a culture, they, whether they want one or not, they, they're going to have one. The, the biggest question is whether it's a positive culture or not. And I can tell you, um, you know, as, as Patty said, I had the privilege of being the founding principal of two new high schools here in New Hampshire. And when I went into that, I was convinced that providing the right culture was the most important thing that I could do as a high school principal in building a new school. Curriculum and, and assessment, those are things that are going to change over time and you can adjust to that. Um, but, but having a culture where people um, really support each other and support students, that, that's the, the magic sauce, if you will, I think, in all schools. The second standard is uh, student learning and that looks at curriculum, instruction, and assessment through the lens of students, their experience in the classroom. Now, the one thing that we don't do is we don't prescribe what kind of curriculum you should have. What we, what we do say is that you should look at the curriculum experts in the various areas, and you should use information from those people uh, to help you determine on a local level what your curriculum is. And so that's why if you go to a school here, um, or if you go to a school in Connecticut, you might find some similarities in the curriculum that they offer, but you also find some differences based on the local decisions that were made about curriculum. The third standard, professional uh, practices, this looks at those same three areas, curriculum instruction and assessment, but through the lens of the adults in the building. So what are the uh, policies? What are the structures? What are the practices? Uh, that a school or a district has put in place to support the professionals, the, the, the educators, the paraprofessionals, um, the support professionals in the school to ensure that they're able to meet students' needs. The fourth standard is uh, learning support, uh, and this looks at a couple of areas where we support student learning, specifically in the area of library media services, in the area of um, school counseling services, health uh, and nursing services, and special student ser services. So things like um, special education, 504, ELL, or other supports that are in place uh, for students that aren't identified. And then the, the last, uh, the fifth standard, is uh, learning resources. And that looks at uh, the resources that the, the district, the school, and the community have in order to implement. Uh, the, the educational program for students. So five standards, and then within those standards, if you go through the book, we have what we call principles, so we've broken those standards down to be a little bit more explicit. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Edwards, for coming this evening. Um, you talked about the campus level district view, yeah. and then I heard you leave in though, the vision of a graduate. Right. And I hear the word community an awful lot. Yeah. And ultimately, nationwide, there's an awful lot of work on community based accountability systems, which they're describing going into a building and prescribing, asking key questions and the change agents that are between the levers in place to say, well, what is the definition of success for Baby? Yeah. What's the definition of success for Memorial? Or better, at Fremont. So I guess my question here, and it's just a uh, true transparency and trying to understand, I hear the definition of a, a division um, of a graduate could holistically be different at Memorial Elementary, starting at that young age based upon the community and what their definition of success means, what they want I as a parent guardian in Memorial Elementary for students. I might want something different than some old baby or over at Fremont. So how does this all bubble up and transpire and track moving towards the campus weather in Oregon. What are we trying to achieve here? Because I know we're up for accreditation at some point. Yeah, well, let me, let me just answer one quick question. Sure. The reason why George is here, and I don't know if this has been clear to the board, is that our accreditation is due. So we have to decide, are we going to 
do this again at the building level the way it's been done in the past, or are we going to do it as a district level accreditation? When I spoke to George, or Michael spoke to George right before he left, uh, the, the, the message that George gave was that he wanted to come and share with you the differences between what we have had in the past, which is that each building was individually accredited, versus doing a whole district accreditation. And as part of my entry plan, one of the things that, that I identified and, and talked about was that in addition to needing intervention support for academics, reading and math, for children and writing, um, there also were some issues around the curriculum around developing specific units to be built upon from year to year. So that's a, an, an example of a curriculum issue that NEAS would look at for us as a whole district. So, so I think it's really important to recognize that our, currently our schools have been individually, we're a rare district in the sense that each of our schools is actually NEASC accredited. And we're the first district in the state of New Hampshire there was. Thank you. Thank by you. The way. Right, so, so I, I certainly want to maintain that. And the question before us and the question for George is, are we going to do that as a district, or are we going to do it building by building? And that, that's what we're... But, but to clarify that, because like, what's the harm in following the result? Because quite frankly, that's the movement still nationwide, and we can probably test for that for sure, that, that those two layers exist. Yeah. And, like that. And, and so I didn't mean to suggest that uh, district accreditation was at the expense of school-based accreditation. So what we would do, so we're actually getting ready for a, a district accreditation visit to um, the first district in Maine who will be uh, district accredited. And uh, what we're doing in that instance is we will have a team go into, they have three schools in their district, so there'll be a team that goes into each of those three schools and they'll look at each of the individual schools, but they'll also get to cross-reference, you know, uh, what's happening between schools and how the continuity from school to school is either um, really helping the school or how it could be improved to help student learning even more. So um, there will be a level of school-based uh, feedback that will be provided to the to the individual schools but there'll also be some district feedback that will be given. And to, to get to your question about the vision of the graduates, so what we've seen in school districts is that the district will work with its community to identify what are those knowledges, dispositions, skills, and understandings that they believe their students should know and be able to do by the time they graduate. And then they kind of backward plan from there, and they look at, okay, so, you know, for instance, one of the, um, areas that many districts identify is, is uh, communication, that students will be good communicators. And so then what does being a good communicator look like at the high school? What does that look like at the middle school level? What does it look like at the upper elementary or the lower elementary level? Because it's going to look different, right? And hopefully there's going to be a progression that takes place and it will be built upon from one level to the other. So. Yeah, it will look different at Bakey than it looks at the middle school, than it looks at the high school. But the idea is that it will be a progression that will build on each other, you know, Yeah. If I'm correct, what I heard you say, that, sir, um, you would follow the students, for example, if they came from the middle school to the high school, you would see that they were prepared to enter into the high school. I'm using late yeah, terms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? We have free market in our school district to pay tuition. Mm -hmm. How do you then ensure that free market students are prepared to enter in? Or would you make a report, for example? I mean, I, I don't know yeah, yeah, what you yeah. do, and say, okay, here's our report, free market, here's our report, you might want to, because they are not part of our school district. Right. But I happen to have some experience with the students from there and sometimes we were, and this is many many years ago not today folks not today but many many years ago um, I met this as a teacher here they were quite as prepared in the science that was many years ago today and I can see it now right but so I'm concerned I don't know about how it is today I've been retired 10 years but I'm concerned that we're going to be okay we're going to have recommendations for our middle school, yep. but not pass that on. You, you see the, you see yeah, the no, point. Um, 
In my first principalship was at Pembroke Academy, and we had five sending camps sending students to us. So we dealt with that same issue. We would have different levels of skill and knowledge from students coming from different eighth grades to the academy. Right. And um, so in this process, one of the things that we look at is you know the communication and the articulation between sending and receiving schools. And although you know we can make recommendations about you know there there should be greater articulation, there should be you know um, a vertical articulation of the curriculum or you know things of that nature. Um, you know just like you can't dictate to a different school board what they should do we can't either so we can make recommendations hopefully those recommendations are actionable and can lead to improvement so that there isn't a skill development issue or a knowledge um, issue between students coming from different sending schools those are the kinds of things that we can try to school by school if that problem is eliminated right yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would, I would I would like to see Fremont. So, I like to see Fremont regardless of all of this and how someone gets. There's an ask here, and so is there an ask here? Ultimately, to go ahead, and, to go ahead for the definition of success, and also meet the needs that you're trying to put forth and move forward with. Enough. Well, the ask here is, first of all, I, I I think it's important to note our accreditation is coming up. Mm -hmm. Wait, when is it coming up? Uh, we we would be looking to do it the fall. Well, it depends on what we choose to do, because we are due to do it at any time at this point. Okay. So it it we're right in that zone where we can do it this next year, or we can wait another year. But don't forget, unless things have changed, and my guess is probably not that much, facility is a big piece of that. It is. And our high school was at risk 15 years ago when we were still at the seminary building. That's right. So are we putting the cot for the horse? We've got some serious facility issues now, right. and while I, I, I assume we were district wide anyways, I don't see it. I guess I don't have a problem with doing the different school this time, but we have administrative teams that are coordinating our curriculum. They have parent groups that are integrated between schools and between grades. All that's been going on anyway. I would, I would. Uh, you uh, see where you're going with this? Uh, uh, having gone through them in the old high school, I know just what you mean. But let me just say this: He's here to make a presentation. This is all discussion for when we have that discussion. Yeah. So I don't want to start going down a road that that we're going to end up going down the same road in a couple well, of weeks. Well, I have one rather more than I would ask. If we well, need to keep it right. germane to what, his, yeah, yeah. what he said. Would it be a true statement, sir, that a lot of times in these accountability accreditation systems are aligned with strategic plans? And yes. Also, okay. So, with that being said, with the fact that the superintendent has created a needs analysis when he first came here, okay. we need to revise the strategic plan if you have some in the coming year. We have some more. And this accreditation product, uh, process potentially complements that. I endorse you know, merging these two things together to move the needle on facilities, move the needle on the curriculum, and move the needle on make sure our culture and community is happy. So these things, if they're all pillars that help support that, I'm going to No, I, I, I was actually, Corey, Corey basically just said what I was trying to say. So it, I've been it, all day. I thank you. No, 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 no. Thank you, Corey. I, I, my, the purpose is, I, I believe that, that before Michael left, I asked him to talk to George, and I do want to clarify for myself that something wasn't lost in translation. Um, George, my understanding was that we could do a district level accreditation instead of doing all the individual schools. Is that not true? Or is that true, that we could participate in a district level accreditation? Or is, is it, is that is true? So the district level accreditation looks at each of the schools as a district, as a whole. So. Um, yeah, what you're saying is true. Yeah, and, and so my, my point was that during my entry plan, to tie this back to what Corey was saying, as we look at our facilities, as we look, we've looked at enrollments, we've looked at the, the you know the size of our buildings, the, the locations, of what's going on. It would be very timely to have me ask you a district look for accreditation purposes as we look to revamp our strategic plan. It would really help us to do that. So I support, and I'm asking you to consider supporting. A district-wide accreditation 
Um, and that would cover all, all of our schools. I felt like the team, the administrative team, and I want to be clear, not just me, we talked about this, that they feel that the, the, the time and commitment of the accreditation process is less, it's, it's a significant task, but it's way less than what it was 10 years ago. That's can you talk about that, George? Because that was a real selling point for the administrative team. I can, yes. Um, we re completely revamped our, not only our standards, but also the accreditation process. Um, and we've significantly reduced the amount of time that it takes a district to go through the process, and also the size of the teams that we send in when the teams come in. So um, we've, we've basically reduced the size of the teams in half. It, it might be slightly larger for a district because of the number of buildings that we would need to visit. Um, but our self-studies, you know, the last self-study that I did, it, we, we spent about two years doing self-study. Uh, we've really been able to reduce that effort down to uh, about six months. Um, so yeah, it, it is a much shorter process. Uh, but the interesting thing is, so we're a year and a half into this new process. We introduced this process a year and a half ago. Um, and the, the thing that I think is amazing is that even though we've reduced the length of the self-study and self-reflection process, we're still getting incredibly rich information from schools. I, I have a colleague, uh, Ned Gallagher, who retired uh, last year from our association, and he used to talk about the accreditation process as being like a gas. It's gonna fill the container that you give it. And so um, you're absolutely right. It is a more manageable process and the visits are more manageable and they're more closely aligned to your strategic plans, which is, um, I think, it's a key part of the process. Can I ask one more follow-up yeah. question? Yeah. Sir, I, I, I do think that Ms. Alessio had a, a really good point that we've got a lot of irons in the fire right now and and part of why we asked Mr. Edwards to be here tonight is because we need to give him and the administrative team some guidance about when we're looking at our accreditation. And within that, which one would we do? Would we do district wide or we do building by building? Because building by building is a very different process. So so I, I guess my question is what the public would want to know. I would want to know as a dad of a son who would be going to our high school in this freshman year, I would want to know if we do a district wide accreditation. Do we still retain the, the status in the eyes of college admissions that our high school is a NEASC accredited high school? Right. The answer is yes, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So for the public, I just wanted the public to hear that, that, that we, are, we are currently accredited at every school, so we felt like district accreditation would make sense from an efficiency standpoint instead of having every school go through their own individual process again. So I apologize if that wasn't clear at the beginning of the presentation, but it, it is important to recognize that, that I'll be asking the board at an upcoming meeting to, to make a decision about this, and I wanted George to present the initial information, give you the pamphlets, give, give Mr. Baker some time to read the standards that are in here, think about it, and then we can decide what to do based on all of our activities that are happening simultaneously. Never mind the budget. Never mind the budget. So I've been through two, two accreditation cycles at my community college, and I think we should wait a year and not do it this fall because we had committees formed and we had to gather evidence and so forth. Um, what I'm wondering, you've had a year and a half experience with the district wide accreditation. Um, what have you found when you've applied it to schools? And you mostly go for the district wide option. If they don't, why don't they? Because that seems to me to signal some kind of inherent. This harmony in the district that the schools don't want to work together to show that they are a unified unit. Um, what have you found when you've seen both approaches? So we've had a lot of interest in the district-wide approach. We've really only just in the last six months uh, began offering it as an option. We have a couple of pilots that we're working with. Um, so it is really, it, it's a newer approach to the accreditation process. We think it makes sense for districts particularly districts where all the schools are already accredited, such as yours, to go through the district approach because of the uh, continuity that it provides across the different buildings in the district, and also because of the savings of time and expense that it would provide for the district. So 
Um, we've got a lot of interest in it. I have another uh, presentation that I'm doing um, in, in a week. Um, I have um, a number of schools in Maine. Uh, I have a school in Vermont. I have, uh, or districts, I should say. I have uh, a couple of districts in Massachusetts and a couple of districts in Connecticut that are all on the verge. And, and I have to say that for many of them, it's a matter of determining. Now, these districts that I'm talking about are districts where all the schools are not currently accredited. So they have some work to do in order to make sure that their schools are ready to go through the accreditation process. So we're seeing a lot of interest in it. I think um, it will grow as fast as we can allow it to grow. Um, it, it's been a capacity issue for us, and it's been an issue of really the timing. So the introduction of these new standards was a really important step in moving towards district accreditation because these are standards for elementary, middle, and high schools, whereas previously we had two separate sets of standards. So I think things are in place. There's a lot of interest, and I think we're going to see uh, many more districts become accredited district-wide in the future. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Good okay, committee reports. Policy, how we go? Policy met at my 14th, and we reviewed the rest of the day policy just in the night. Our next meeting is February 6th at 4.45 p.m. in the SAU office, and as always, the public is invited to attend the meetings. What time is it again? 4.45 on the 6th of February. 6? 4.45 p.m. on the 6th. 6th. I don't know if it's 5th or 6th. Oh, sorry. The 6th. Education. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a student achievement committee that uh, early in the evening. I'll get my report at the evening. Our next EISA meeting is uh, February 13th at 3.30. Here. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Finance met on January 16th, and the committee members present were Tammy Mahoney, Electro LCO, Jim Baker, plus administrator Michelle Coto, along with assistant Kristen McNulty. The minutes from our December 12th meeting were reviewed and approved. Now, the business manager, our administrator, updated the committee on various fund balances. The total of the fund balance is as of November 30th. On our Special ed, $234,130 and change. Uh, facilities use, $177,905 and change. And since November 30th, $13,991 was allocated for urgent repairs at Memorial School and Middle School. And that leaves a capital improvements fund balance of $143,000. $563 and change. We reviewed budget expense reports from July 1st to December 31st. Uh, health and dental expenses for the period are $1,829,406. The general fund expenses, excluding health and dental, are through that period are $12,632,934.48. We also reviewed and approved balance transfers from various general fund accounts to other related accounts. The majority of these funds were adjustments between health insurance, retirement, salaries, and facilities accounts. And the total of the funds transfers reviewed was $116,564. The next finance committee meeting is scheduled for February 20th at 430 p.m. Public relations. Uh, public relations meets next Wednesday, January thirtieth at four thirty. Personnel. Personnel has not met in a while. All the negotiations have gone through. There has been a major negotiation. 
That's the stage next. <coughs> Our, as indicated, we haven't met in the last board meeting. We haven't met since prior board meeting in December. Our next scheduled meeting is January 28th at 4.30 p.m. at the SSP. And then there's also a special meeting afterwards in February 12th from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. with the semifinalists for the principal position of the SSP. The governing board will be um, there to potentially ask questions as well for the finals. So we can get two to three semifinals as well. So, so uh, I just want to comment. Yep, sorry. comment. There was a um, article uh, Chronicle highlighted Seco School of Technology this past week as well. Um, you probably heard or saw that going on the social network ways recently. It's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I And budget? Yes, we had our uh, budget hearing. It's uh, over. Our next meeting will be the <coughs> Okay. Um, how am I doing? <laughs> not doing okay. You know, at my age, I'm not right. I'm <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, most of the class are still working on all their winter final stuff. Uh, getting ready for that. It's getting to it's been in full swing for a while. Um, the sophomores are finishing up some of their uh, staff calendars like they did last year, <coughs> or freshman last year. Uh, the juniors are getting a jump start on their t-shirts for Winter Carnival. They're selling two different ones. Uh, and the seniors have have been planning Winter Semi, uh, which actually this Friday. They're actually at the Austin House right now, so. so. We had our winter content winter meeting uh, a couple weeks ago, and the theme was the amazing race. Uh, it was pretty fun. It was really good bonding experience for all of us. Uh, there were a bunch of different activities for us to do, and it was like all throughout the school, so we had to run from place to place. Um, my team actually got to uh, lip sync in front of everybody, so that was fun. I'm sure. If, yeah, that's not here. But I'm sure if you ask him, he has a video. What else? Which lip sync? Uh, we lip sync the beginning of Jump Star. <laughs> so. And then Murray Carnival, all the grades are getting into their preparations. Uh, the packet's almost complete. It was, it was actually, we were supposed to go over it yesterday, but had the two-hour delay. Um, uh, we just need to finish up some rules for some of the new games we're putting in. Uh, that's it. We're going to go with the models. I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah no. You wow. might have to go with the politics. What's your major going to be in school? Politics. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think I'm think i actually thinking of going uh, to do business. Because okay, political science, that sounds like it might be the answer. It depends on what you ask. Great answer. I took uh, Evan's election class a couple years ago. I'm in AP Gov right now, so mm -hmm. you never know. Um, okay. Uh, no business and public comments. Come on now, we've got five of you down there. I know, uh, uh, there's always one of you. Carol, thank you. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it, right? Yep, yeah, always a few words. Thank you. Um, Mr. Edwards isn't here anymore, but um, perhaps the board would be um, look into this. And it was in regards to cost of the um, accreditation. Is there a difference in the cost of district accreditation versus <coughs> individual schools? And then also, I was wondering, since the schools have been accredited individually, <coughs> are they all up for re-accreditation at the same time, or that the years staggered, um, and I would um, support the notion of perhaps waiting until we kind of get a lot of these um, issues that we're dealing with now in the district um, a little bit more better handle on them, because we certainly would want to come out good and, and to be able to be accredited. Um, we wouldn't want some things that we're dealing with now to. Um, 
non-controversial and um, they either have updates the mandated language or minor word changes and 23 of the 33 pertain to student medication and health policies so they're mainly regulatory changes and upgrades that are needed nothing explosive four of them are redundant so we request repeal of those they, they duplicate other policies the only three I point to that you may want to pay attention to and perhaps discuss during second read would be JLCF wellness policy, which has a revision that adds another committee. And I'm sure we all want to add another committee to our calendars, but a wellness committee, which the board creates with different stakeholder groups. JQ-R, which is student fees, fines, and charges regulations. Um, there's a section there that Mr. Dawson can discuss if there's a question about that one. And then JRA, student records and access, is an interesting change on page two. I just want to note that um, the agenda under policies to be repealed, um, if you look under that section, where it says, right here j l c d dash e dash r2 school health services that is mislabeled that actually is j l c e dash r2 when you click that on that's the actual code so the school health services has the wrong code next to it it should be j l c e dash r2 that's the policy code. Mrs. Brown? It's just a typo, that's all. Is there an R2D2 and a C3PO? <laughs> <laughs> well, there used to be a beer policy, but we oh, okay. it okay. I had that. to ask. I always thought that was pretty good. Y'all know when you Star Wars fan. No, I, I, I would say that uh, for the first read in particular, I, I want to let you all know, unless someone has a, a, a question about one of these, a member could move the group. You don't have to discuss each one of these individually. You don't have to approve them individually. You may move the entire team, or you could list a number of policies to move at once. I'm just trying to coach you around how to expedite this because we're warming up. Well, this is just the first three. Just saying. Yeah. Now, Mr. Dawson's here. He's hiding. I see him over there. Um, <laughs> is, the wellness, is the wellness committee required as a part of the policy or just recommended? We were going to check on that. I just wasn't sure who we was. So we didn't oh, have to check. Okay. That. All right, we will look into that. We need to check on that. We will look into that before the next meeting. I'm sure right the now. superintendent meets with the school nurse and is updated on what is needed and so forth. I don't know if we need a brand new committee for yet another um, aspect of the district. Yeah. Okay. I would only advocate for that if it's required by law. It only requires one school sure. board member to look at you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, those are going to be really fast meetings. You need to know that right now. <laughs> Let me go to the other two. AQ, that's R. Hold on. Student fees and fines. There's an addition to that policy, and these changes come from the school board association, unless the administration recommends completion of these. Under part five, this has to do with providing the transcripts, I believe, to students who are graduating and going on to university. So if if fines and fees haven't been paid, in those instances, part five, hold on. In those instances where financial responsibilities are not met, the following conditions may be in effect. C has been added. Student records will not be communicated directly from the school to post-secondary programs or other designations as requested by the student or their parent guardian until all fees have been Okay. And this is something that 
community colleges do. I hear from my students all the time, can you please add me? I'm waiting for my library fines to be paid, but I really want to add your class, but I can't. Um, so it's not unusual to have this policy, but Mr. Dawson might want to I may be wrong, so Mr. Dawson's shaking his head. I live back in my box, so. Um, Can you hold on to this one second? Sure. I'm not too sure if we're not too far ahead of ourselves just yet. You should make a motion before we just yeah. Well, no, no. Yeah. What I'm wondering is, would you want to go through 821 and do those and go to the next one and go to the next one? Okay. Then go to where you're at. I'd like to make a motion. Yeah, no, that's fine. Do you see what I'm saying? I'd like to. I've read all of these. I think everybody else has. Right. I'd like to, to move these except for the JLCF wellness policy. Okay, so I'm which ones? That. Okay, well, which ones are you saying? All of them. All, all of them on the list except, except for JLCF. Okay. I'm just concerned about the wording. Okay, that's fine. I uh, want to make sure we're all on the same Listed on the January 23rd, 2019 agenda. Okay. Fellas, have you got that all right? Yes. Final. Sir. Final. That's, that's a little bit of a mouthful if we're not careful. You want to move to me? Ellie, second. I second. Yeah, okay. Second. Okay. Second read. Yeah, question. First and second read. First and second read. Can we do first and second? Yes. First and second. All right. Do it again. Okay. Second read. 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 I also want to thank no, Dr. Hold Brown hold for hold all the work she did on this, which was obviously a huge money. It was all Phyllis Kennedy's work. Uh, no, it's Mr. Dawson. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Dawson. It's Mr. Dawson. It's going to gallop on the Are you where we need to be at right now? I mean, yes. she's got the unenviable task of having to turn around right, turn around and see oh, no. what So I, I only look at her and notice. So we're discussing everything except. No, so we're, we're up to speed, folks. Yes. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so we got the motion in a second. Discussion. So I'd like to hear from Mr. Dawson about J2 Well, okay, yeah, we can, we can. Okay. But I think that's the one we're going to discuss. No, no, that's no. JLCF. No, he did not present that one. Right. So we that, can't that's the one we're going to be discussing. Yes, this is part of the set. Okay, so we need to move on the motion of that one, except the one that's the last one. No, no, no. no. These are all the same. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah. 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 All right. Call for discussion. Okay, I got it. All, all right. but one. Okay, I got it. You're up, sir. Yeah, I think with the last two months, it's very confusing. Um, JQR <laughs> is a uh, student fees, fines, and rate charges and regulations. It talks about basically kids paying back what they owe us and so forth. Um, the, the change that Dr. Brown is referring to is in number five. Um, the attorney has informed us that it's a violation of FERPA, which is the Federal uh, Student Records Act, for us to withhold a student record from a parent. We cannot deny them a report card or a school transcript or their student's record. We're not allowed to do that. Um, we did have some debate about whether or not that would include a diploma. I would argue it would, uh, withholding a student's diploma. However, we do want to create some leverage to get the money back. Um, and with your debate, and part of what I, my tack on all this is to include more language that I think might belong in there that you guys can debate and potentially pull it out. The three options we have would be the student would not participate in the graduation exercises, which they're not guaranteed a right to um, by the law. They would not be able to participate in non-academic extracurricular activities if they owe us money, which is something we call, say, the senior trip or something around the end of their school year. And the third one we're talking about is we cannot deny the parent the right to the transcript of the student, actually, because they're 18, uh, almost all of them they graduated. But we do not have to supply that directly to the college. Of course, colleges require, they don't want to get a transcript from a kid, they want to get it from school. We don't have to share it with the school. We do have to share it with the student. And so that third leverage would be to provide, uh, so we would be not providing it to the schools, we would provide it to the student because we have to do that. So that's kind of the logic there. Could, could we make it that all fees must be paid as a requirement to graduate? I, I believe the graduation is earned through the collection of credits and checking off the actual area. So they would actually graduate. The graduation doesn't actually occur necessarily at the stage of graduation that several students last year who chose not to participate. They still graduate. What we can do is deny them the right to receive their records and so forth after they graduate if they don't uh, pay us back. And we also added down there at number seven, they gave the superintendent the right to do some collection 
uh, actions afterwards if that amount of money was, you know, believed to be significant. But I borrowed that language from another policy in the um, the policy book. Yes, sir. It's your so what, what what are the fees you're talking about? Uh, primarily here it would be an athletic uniform, a uh, Chromebook. They turn their Chromebook in at the end of their career and the screen is cracked, which would be like a $35 fee. Um, we don't have a lot of textbooks to go out to kids, but it could be in library books, things like that. Various and sundry costs that we have. It's, my experience is that it's not a huge deal to get these back from students because the hook is usually, like if you say to a kid, you can't just take graduation if you don't pay up, they pay up. Is lunch, is lunch included in that? Um, yes, because the lunch money is owed to us. So I'm looking at Michelle and she's not. So, yeah. so um, I get emails from my daughter's lunch money is like $5 below. <laughs> can I card in elementary school? It's crazy, yeah. but um, my question is, I'm concerned about the language in the sense that we have a horrific event that occurs where a parent overdoses and there's a student who's going here and he or she is the only guardian of him or herself. And ultimately he or she has not qualified or gone out for free meal, you know, free or reduced lunch. So in that situation, ultimately my daughter's left alone to her own devices. She's you know, there's a whole lot of challenges going on. If we do a hard, fast language, we are penalizing someone for something that he or she could not have helped them to their own work. But the policy says may. No, yeah. not everywhere. No, it does. Up above, it says in those instances where financial. But right under five, it says may. Number five, it says may. 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 So that is critical. But, but, but Mr. Baker indicated like a few on the line the same. Uh, you know. No, I just asked if it was. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's all. Yes, I mean, I just want to like, yeah. safeguard, unfortunately, that. We were told it wasn't, so it's not an issue. That's true. For the discussion. Are you going to find more? Yeah. JRA? I think you should define, I think you should define all what services are, services that are of, of concern in the student handbook. I would advise that. Okay. I mean, does that make sense to you? Not entirely, no. So I'm, saying, I'm saying if there's different fees that occur, mm -hmm. what is the definition of a fee? And we just heard that question here. Mm -hmm. As a default, does anyone else dare agree with that question at four level? I think that it's more nebulous than that. Okay. Yeah. Because then it gives more flexibility and way to interest yeah. Yeah. I think I think the key is that I just want to make sure we, we do we are working on some situations that I will not disclose in any detail where the lunch balance has been excessive, or the computer fee is bigger, or there have been issues with vandalism, let's say, and they owe them district money for, I'm just making stuff up at this point as examples, but the more room that we have to exercise that to hold these documents and processes at the end, the more likely we are to collect those balances in the end. It gives us some flexibility. But there is room for me to work, which is why I like for in May. Yeah. We, we've had instances where a student would own, let's say, a textbook, and honestly, they didn't trash the book or they can't find the book. Um, I've dealt with a situation where a student would give us uh, basically a purchase receipt for the book from Amazon to be delivered to us. And actually, that works better for us because we end up getting the book back as opposed to getting a check which has to go in the bottom line of the general fund. So that actually works for everybody. The kid actually pays less money for the book. We end up getting the book back that we need. So that receipt would be sort of a promise that they're going to do what they need to do, and that gives us the flexibility to do things like that. I don't, I don't even keep part on it, but I know there's districts nearby that the students are seriously high outstanding lunch balances, mm -hmm. and I bet I've seen those systems that I put them in. Do we get that information as a child is transferring in? So say, oh, here's a safe party and stuff? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. JRA has a change, which I think parents and students will appreciate. Um, Okay. 
procedures to seek correction of education record has been modified. So if you want to correct something in your transcript or your um, grades, it's been changed to, to procedures to seek correction or, uh, or insert explanation to education records. So parents of students or eligible students have the right to insert an explanation respecting the content of the educational record and a right to seek change to any part of the record. Um, so they can add a written explanation to their um, student records. Is this something the School Board Association recommends? Um, I believe, reading this going over this today, I believe this is actually, um, the attorney used the word state requirement. So I would assume this is a, a change in the law that went along with the four requirement. Um, that change, so the change to the RSA, one in nine sixty six. we talked about a lot of them. So it seems now analogous to when you have an evaluation report as an employee, you're allowed to add something yes. to the file. That's mm -hmm. right. And that's yep. basically what it is. For yep. And there are cases with a discipline issue where they might want to explain what the discipline issue right. was in the case of a, you know, very rarely get somebody who's looking at a student's discipline record. Usually it's either a military or a security clearance type of issue. But that would be something you want to say, all right, let me explain what happened. We're actually very careful when we read this one report for students to make sure we really exactly what that is. But it's so a protection for the students and parents. Yeah, definitely. Right. Right. That's a positive change, but yeah, it's fine to let everyone know it's in here. Can I say it is a positive change in the sense that it clarifies that a parent has the right to request that we consider their point of view in a matter of the student record. And if we can't come to an agreement or if we just don't agree, then the district would maintain the record that the parent has a right to ask you to write. Exactly like an employment evaluation, you have the opportunity to say, I acknowledge the receipt of this, however, I disagree, and these are the reasons why, and I'll become a part of it. Right. That's exactly it. Okay. Do we have a motion on the floor? Anybody disagree? Yep. Um, just one second, fellas. Mm -hmm. uh, you're up to speed, Yes, motion. Want to read the motion just yes. to make sure. Mm -hmm. A motion by Mr. Baker to approve all J policies on the 123. January 23rd agenda for first and second read, except for policy JICF. JLCF, sorry. JLCF. And those are the ones we just talked about. Yeah. Right? So well, they're part of all the ones we're going to. Well, you said accept it, so. We haven't talked about JLCF. Yeah, because that's okay. next week. You want to talk about that one, and then we can make a motion to approve it. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. okay, all right. Good. So we're not going to review the others. Everyone's pretty good with those. They have minor tweaks and right. legal changes, but I think uh, everything else is fine. And this is first and second read for us? Yes. Yep. Okay. Any more discussion? <laughs> you took a breath. Wait. <laughs> no, okay. Well, you know, you take a breath before you speak, right? I'm ready to vote. Okay, no, that's fine. You went. Who is going to say something? Okay. I'll... Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> I can't do that, so I've been sitting over here like, all those in favor. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all those in favor. All right. Okay. Moving on. Okay, before we move on, I just, Bob's meeting. Bob, thank you. Bob, thank you, Bob. Phyllis, I'm not done. I got more to go. Bob, Bob and Phyllis, thank you. And we do have a team of folks that have been working on this really dog and it is great. We're there really are grateful. a few uh, editorial things. Fine. I'm not bringing them up. I just tell you guys to do them again. Well, we can't change them now because you've adopted them. So those need to come up in these, but we can take a look at it and have a conversation. Um, just so you know, the lawyers will often send us things that do not read well editorially. I, I have been... All I'm saying, well, there was one place where there was an effect, it was an effect thing. Okay, feel free to send those kinds of little tweaks. Okay, there's a couple of people just email them. Strictly editorial, there's nothing to do with the intent or the, the yeah, proofreading. Yeah. Feel free to email me those before these meetings, though, because I can adjust them right before we get here and it's better. Okay. But I'm okay with it, I can take a look at it. And if there's a problem, I can take a look at it. No, that's okay. that's okay. I didn't know we were going to be first and second tonight. So if we, you know, we do those in between. Well, that's it. I'm, I'm looking at Larry saying, are we going out of the club? I told my wife we'd be late. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, I can get you. <laughs> 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 we can get you. 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 We can
Okay. Uh, uh, there is, yeah, eight three. Am I correct? That's that. Yeah. Four scrubber. Okay, Michelle, four scrubber. Um, based on prior conversations, we did pursue a lease arrangement to purchase the four scrubber. So at this stage, we would need a vote, a resolution of the board to approve and instruct the administration to move forward with um, the appropriate, completing the appropriate paperwork and securing. So the lease arrangement is with municipal leasing consultant, and it's as I said, five years. It's five years. Um, the payments actually start July one of nineteen. So I don't need to be securing the equipment now. It doesn't impact the budget until the next fiscal year. And the annual payment is two thousand five hundred thirty-one dollars and fifty four cents. Could, could you explain that it died and why? I mean, they yes, don't know yeah. the. Sorry, yeah, I'm saying history. that people who knew the history. They don't know the history. Now. So, yeah. my apology now. Yes, the uh, piece of equipment which is used extensively um, died a slow death. And then we tried to, to revive it and it worked intermittently, um, but it isn't really relied on extensively. And so, was Mr. Yes. Ramos driving it at, at the time? I tried. They wouldn't let me. I was not the part of the question. <laughs> I call it the Jim Zambo. <laughs> yeah. um, cool. So this seems to be the um, best approach that we could take to meet the current need and not impact the current budget. This is an item for the next year's budget. But and it's coming out of next year's budget. We just want your approval to go forward. So if we have a motion, go ahead. Second. So many seconds? Yeah, uh, already did. Already did. Okay. Any okay. further discussion? All in favor? Right. Uh, you want to get out of here tonight? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Hey, Michelle, vending machine. You haven't left yet. Yeah. <laughs> We're an hour ahead, Mike. Yes. Remember that one when I went away. We talked about this and we just wanted to make sure that we talked about this extensively. And a subcommittee meeting in that there was a request um, by the same one who basketball organization to put a vending machine at the squeezy gym. Um, to my knowledge, there's never been a response to that nature of the street in the past. Um, there might be a protocol for this, and so we're looking for some guidance on how to proceed with that. I mean, we did have some conversation at the committee level in terms of some parameters and potentially sending a, a letter to the um, group. There was questions that we had asked and we wanted to get back to the Yeah, we, we, our discussion was around what costs would be incurred um, as far as the installation. Is there electricity there? And, and those costs should be more if this is approved, they should be borne by the, the group who wants to install this. And, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because what I'm about to say is going to sound so chintzy and so picky you. Yeah. But. Well, let me finish. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were. I, I might sound like you You might. I might have to say play. How's that going to happen? Um, the other thing was is that they specified a, a drink machine, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so immediately comes to mind spills and that sort of thing, and the janitorial costs uh, to take care of that. Um, so, uh, Dr. Brown suggested a trial period of one year, um, and so we, we, we thought that was a good idea. And then also letting them keep 100% of the profits because if one group does this, it's likely that other groups are going to want to do it as well at some point. So letting them keep 100% of the profits the first year to offset the cost of electricity or whatever they have to install there. Um, and then after that, the district would, ship, would, would receive a small amount of whatever the net profit is. And that would follow through for any other group that wanted to do this that was approved. That's basically my recollection. Yeah, there's a clarification there. Uh, we requested that 
three quarters into the year, there would be a financial report provided to see the amount of activity that's going on. Yep. Um, just to see, like, we don't want to take the 30 bucks that they make. You know what I mean? So it's just one first year introduction, where they're making, what type of costs have we as a district occurred, incurred, right. and where are they actually making. Um, okay. Let me just let me just read something quickly, and this is out of the book because it'll explain exactly what I'm trying to say. And this is uh, due with Chapter 31. As a general rule, town money cannot be granted to a private person, company, or organization unless that private person takes on some obligation to benefit the town or the school district. So the problem is, and it's called quid pro quo. So the problem, quite literally, is and it's going to sound chintzy that we're going to be paying an expense, but there's no public benefit to us. So we need to figure some way that they would give us. Now, I would suggest that they give us a percentage of their profit. And that doesn't have to be anything big, but that is the statute. Now, I know that sounds minor, but I agree. Other organizations are going to come in and say, oh, they made $200, we can make it. So if we don't derive a benefit, then we can't do it. And I don't want to get to the whole Miguel, that's why I just read this. So I would suggest that I don't care what the percentage is, but something to cover ourselves with well, the statute. We were talking initially after that first year, 25%. Well, I know you can go even first year. I, what I would suggest is, oh. you know, is you know what you want to put it in. Give us 25, 10 percent. I don't care what number percent of the profit. Well, it could be one percent the first year where they have the cost of like installing electricity. Well, that could be one. Other I just want to say true to the statute but down the road, especially. Good point. I was going to say, I'm happy to read um, to the direction that the facilities committee um, took to be like, like, um, there was a motion that um, request the group to the, they approve the request of the group for the single day machine in the Swayze Gym with the following conditions. Um, one is the Riley, the facilities director, approves the location. That the youth group covers all installation and all loan costs. The district assumes no responsibility for the equipment. Um, an estimate, we would need an estimate from the vendor of the utility cost that would be subject to the final review in a year to evaluate the cost and at the board's discretion. The possibility of the district charging the fee at 25% of the receipts. This was a considered to be a one year trial, and the activities and transition were required 90 days prior to the um, expiration of the one year installation fee. So those were the comments at the facilities. Mm -hmm. Do you mind? Yeah. Now, for the discussion, like, like, I agree. Yeah. Let's be fully honest. We don't know what this is going to be for revenue generator, number one. Number two, we don't know the amount of expenses that will be occurring. Um, number three, ultimately, these are the taxpayers in our communities who are already paying taxes for our building, and actually, you know, we're trying to encourage youth involvement, get them off the streets, and again, community culture. Uh, last but not least, if we do do this, is it really possibly worth our time to actually have to create another line item and account in the actual accounting system? So, like, like let's just do a year of discovery. I, I agree with you 100%, but I do, I do know that I do know that that that's the statute. You know, and my feeling is, you know what, get them for ten percent of your gross. That's a lot. If they make two hundred bucks, walking ten dollars. Something to keep us true to the statute. Something we can hang our hat on when other places may come in and say we want to whatever. And I, I agree, it, 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 it's going to cost us more money, but we still have to enter in the receipt. But that's, that's the statute. The, the washing the floors. Collecting the bottles, cleaning up the trash. There's Maybe not more than ten percent. I'm just it's safe. Whatever you want to do. Yeah. Um, as far as meeting the statute, I would think it could be argued that providing the soft drinks is a benefit to the community. I don't want to get into all the the, the, the examples here. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right. That, and the book even says that may be a benefit to the community. But that's not the point. It's a quid pro quo. We need to get something because. So when you're saying we, you're talking about it's, the school, the school district. district. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. And I agree. I didn't want to get into the whole group. You know, okay. I just want to keep us pure to the statute right. and protect us for down the road. What about the machine in this building? 
I didn't want to get into that because that's a whole, I, I agree with you. I think that goes to student council, but. Michelle, can you? They're, they're, they're um, coordinated in conjunction with the food service program. Um, it's, 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 what you can it's, not a, it's not a facility that students are typically in, but they live with the other. Concerns would be, it would need to be on a timer so that it's not operational during school hours. Because there's that would be nothing problem. easy in this district. You read these policies, you need to be a Philadelphia lawyer. I don't know how the teachers figure out what they call it's going on. To be honest with you. They ask us and we say yes or no. For real administrators. to make sure the policies the is that has the way to do it. To help them out. But if we open, I mean, I feel like we, I always look over my back as a board member because you can't do anything for the, the nice, to be nice. Yes, you can't. You can't. Because someone's going to bite you in the butt along the way. I first met Pete the first three weeks, he looked at me and said, no good deed goes to punish you, man. <laughs> that was right. his first lesson to me as, as a board chair. I, said my I, I would agree. But, but I would say that, that, that at this point, I think what the facilities committee was looking for, and Jim, tell me if I'm wrong, you're looking for a motion that basically outlines the facilities committee, committee recommendation with a percentage amount in it, no more than 25%. Shall so, I read the motion that we motioned on that meeting? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, I, I think okay. Michelle can show it. Right. Yeah, but we need someone to motion it in the oh, right. okay. So that we can discuss and then decide. And then we can give you a copy. Or you can. <laughs> Focus. Oh, yeah. We're not one of us. Thanks. Would the board entertain a motion to approve the request by the Sanborn Youth Basketball to put a single vending machine at the Swayze Gym with conditions? The conditions are that the facilities director approves the location. Sanborn Youth Basketball covers all installation and ongoing costs. The district assumes no responsibility for the equipment needs and this estimate from the vendor of utility costs subject to final review in a year to evaluate costs and at the board's discretion. The board the possibility of the district charging a fee up to twenty five percent or other of net receipts. This is a one year trial with an activities financial report required ninety days prior to the maturation of a one year to installation. Thank you. Second. 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 Sure. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm going to uh, ask for maybe an amendment on that. The amendment is going to be that we authorize the facilities, the facilities appliance, the facilities to determine the percentage. So you guys can sit down and say, hey, what do you need to do? Rather than us sit here. Yeah. Done. yeah. Right. Does that, that make sense? Sure. Okay. Okay. So a motion on the amendment. I'll you can just amend it. Just amend the motion. You have to vote it on your okay. okay, that's a right. That way you can. It's a friendly amendment. Yeah. Okay. Any further? Oh, sorry. Are we talking about this new statute that we aren't exposed in any way to any statutory? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 we, well, if that's the only statutory thing, what we'll do we is have a model in place, and that's why I don't think. Yeah. yeah, but the board can vote to approve it pending legal review. Yeah. And we'll send it off to Will just to make sure that it's all solved. Yeah. It's yeah. not yeah. over here. What is that budget for lawyers? No, no, he's in the NHSBA. He's not going to share part of the department. Well, we, well, we do have to pay for a partnership, but it's not. Well, we pay you. We pay you. Yes. We pay you. Please on retainer. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make you feel good either. Uh, no, our lawyer bills have been big this year, I'd say. Oh, I bet they've been dead. Yeah, I'm going to copy the red one. Move the motion. The black one. You have to copy the red one? No. Okay, we're well, on page 17 on this one. So. Yeah. It's under trouble purpose only. Okay, so with the end of the discussion, <coughs> the motion. Move the motion. All, all in favor? Aye. Oh, okay, unanimous. Okay, sorry about that, folks. I didn't mean to, but I'm glad Jim brought up for us because I was a little anxious about that. Sorry, did we like you? Yep, and but we've got Corey. Corey, uh, just in addition for you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Pam sent me an email. I agree. She will be the alternate delegate uh, with Corey. Uh, she asked if she could be. They do allow a delegate and a. Uh, so, uh, also, yeah. alternate, um, 
So she asked if she let it go. You want to give up your Saturday morning? Okay. Uh, 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 all right. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, a couple weeks ago, we went ahead and agreed that we're all going to participate in a online survey for the New Hampshire School Board Association's upcoming delegate, sem delegate assembly that I'll be coming as Mr. Barger indicated as our representative for the local board. Um, I'm going to share with you the fact that you should all be able to see here now. Thank you, sir. Uh, the online survey that was published and available to the rest of the board. Um, indicated that there were some instructions that we will go through and this is actually as if I was taking it, I'll go ahead and had to actually initial it. So all seven board members had participated and as indicated, once we go through and you know, take the initialing, we actually were asked me to go ahead and review the continued resolutions and we're also asked to review the proposed resolutions. There are nine continued resolutions from last year and 11 new proposed resolutions. So what I'm going to do here this evening, um, we're going to go ahead and share our actual results per resolution. Um, and if there's any discussion that the board feels that they, does the board want to go ahead and look at the resolution, share what the NHSBA voted on, and then we went ahead and what we voted on? I think that's important so that it's transparent to the public. Perfect. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start with the continued resolutions here, folks. Bear with me here. Screen it. So the continued resolutions, first one that indicates here, I'll read and I'll bring it as close as possible. New Hampshire School Board Association supports legislative action. I'm not going to. Oh, I didn't read that. Okay. I would present them in the sense All right. that I can give an overview. Yeah. And we've, already, we've already gone over the topic. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, no, no. I... All right. So ultimately, the New Hampshire School Board supports continued resolution for number one. Our governing board here went ahead and continued resolutions for number one. We had set responses. It looks as though 85% of us supported, one opposed, not recommended. Okay, there was no feedback on that one yet. On continued resolution number two, uh, the support for continuing existence of the New Hampshire School Board's retirement system, the NHSBA supports that, and our governing board had. 71% of the board voting in support and recommendation, while two um, had others. Number three, New Hampshire School Board Association supports language legislation that provides parents rights to opt out of content programs. Um, they support that language. Your local government board, myself included, did not. Um, we had 85% support, while yet one did not. Uh, so worth, and there was no responses there. Um, let me go back to the continued resolutions for number two. Apologize, I missed that guy's state requirement. As you can see here, a couple of our peers indicated that it's those who voted against it, they indicated that state requirements should be phased out and private defined contribution plans encouraged by use of public employees. The second comment was rather than taxpayer support and defined benefit pensions, I this your other board members said, I support public employee pensions being phased in to become defined benefit contribution plans such as an IRA or okay. Scott, board, if you want to continue the conversation and what have you. Number four, continued resolution. <coughs> the New Hampshire School Board supports fully funding the school building aid program pursuant to RSA 198-15A. There's a note here that the New Hampshire School Board also believes that an adequate school building is a component of the requirement to provide an adequate education. I only bring this one up because this is obviously important to us. That's why I want to be double as we move forward here. And I advise the community and ourselves to read that um, statute as well. By the way, we, we, these are all posted right on the website if yes. anyone wants to read them in their pool. And this is a public document now that we're reading into the actual Um a, all but one of our fellow board members actually agreed that we support recommend this um, for its work. Number six, New Hampshire School Board Association supports modifying RSA 198. No, pardon me, I apologize. Number five, New Hampshire School Board supports modifying RSA 193-C, colon six, to require that the State Department of Education publishes the results of statewide assessment within 30 days. Um, they support that, where our governing board had 85%, again, one vote opposed. Um, then the feedback on this one, uh, that's wrong, like that. 
Um, we had 85 and 1 as well. And Number 6, the New Hampshire School Board supports modifying RSA 198 colon 38 to provide state funding for the cost of full day pay. All, for all school districts that have chosen to provide kindergarten for an entire school day. This one has us. Um, and our board, six, um, all of one, have opposed. Um, keep kindergarten, fun, keep car, kindergarten funds, taxes, and funding decisions with local school districts rather than funneling them through a state program. Interesting comment. Uh, we chose to bring this in as a state option, or as a local option. Resolution, continuing resolution number seven, New Hampshire School Board Association supports a study of establishing of additional state advocacy aid for public pre-K. That was a heated discussion in 2017, I was actually there for that, just so you know. And that was a friendly amendment on the floor, and I'm really so happy that it's continued to resolve the resolution. Um, our governing board um, was a little divided here. Uh, we had two, one opposed, one that recommended, and Number, and again, that person, someone who might have indicated the same fact for you to keep it local. Senior resolution number eight, the New Hampshire School Board supports modifying RSA 193 colon 12 to add the following. Any person who provides false information for establishing residency for school attendance purposes or any other person who assists in doing so may be required to bring full restitution to the district. Very interesting. Um, that was brought forth last year. Our entire board is for side of the horse. <laughs> um, resolution, team resolution number nine. The New Hampshire School Board Association supports amending pertinent electioneering statutes to clarify the definition of election official, that electioneering by election official may not occur at the polling place, and that a body, public body, may affirmably promote positions established by formal action of that body. Our governing board, um, all but two actually opposed this. This is an interesting one, and the feedback on this was, I did pose if this curtails ordinary freedom of speech at rights. It's not clear from reading the resolution nine what all the polling places means. Rules prohibiting campaigning in close proximity to voting booths already exist. Why this modification needing is election official the same as elected official? This is a great question, and I will definitely bring that up during the meeting for what it's worth. Can we get the clarification? Uh, you're missing my comment, which was essentially that I didn't. I supported the first part. Uh, but not the second part because I felt that that would be a violation of block lectionary laws. All right. Um, if you're missing that comment, by all means, um, just add that in and I'll be sure to add that to the Where would they go in the history? It's a great question because I've tried looking back at the prior years when I, this was introduced last year. And that's what we should really look at. Really because, you know, there's, I mean, and I'm speaking as a block, my blog is was camera for three minutes. Mm -hmm. Election rules are very, very strict true. from yeah. the state, and they're very clear. Now, an election official is usually your clerk, your ballot clerk, your check in, your moderator, your uh, supervisor, the check -in, different than an elected official. Many are elected to be election. Off, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, right, right. So was it a problem with, let's say, a staff member advocating for a position? You know, we had a situation with that a couple years ago. Um, yeah, I think the way I read that, it was not an individual advocating, it was a body advocating. Third election and statutes. So they, they, they must be a, there must be someone trying to amend the electioneering statute and they're and, and they then have remember that these resolutions come from school boards okay, right to the NHSBA and then the this body is the continuing one this is not one of the new ones oh okay this is, the this is the continuing one from last year from so. last year right and, and what I was trying to show here is I did google if you google NHSBA 2018 delegate assembly I can't find information online for last year's review. <laughs> Interesting. which were well, I have a, uh, comment about some of the prior ones for four, six, and seven. State building aid program is four. Six is provide state funding for full day care kindergarten. And seven is um, state adequacy plan for pre-K. I voted no on those three. It wasn't the program, but the funding through the state. Where does the state get its money? From us. 
okay? It doesn't come from Mars, one. And two, in economics, we like to joke about feeding the sparrows to the horses. We're giving it to the big bureaucracy in, in, in concert, and we're getting X minus in back. So I would prefer that these programs be funded locally rather than funding it through a state program where there are winners and losers, obviously. We should have a resolution that when they mandate something, they should fund it. Done. They don't do that now. Funded that. mandates are a source for continued political chaos, which is, I think, the way they like it, okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you never know they what haven't funded anything for a long time before we funded anything in the state of New Hampshire. Corey, my, my comments were committed on there, which were pretty much the same, that kindergarten funding should be a local matter. Yep. No, I'm just going to re-emphasize. I'm going to keep my notes for a second. Um, Mr. Baker, for the record, could you resend your comments to Corey? Sure. So yeah. that he can add them. And also, I would ask that for just objectively as transparency, it really, these should show how each of you vote. Okay. It shouldn't be the, the circular thing. Yeah. It should show so, and it does just who is so you know, the yeah. so, so, as a public member, I would want to know. I just always, uh, you guys are needed in my brain from day one. I wouldn't know why most of them. Well, so. I'll tell you, this information is all here for us. Um, yeah. You can see each one of this is all on a spreadsheet behind the scenes. Yeah. For those of us who know how Google surveys work, you see when we took them, when we recommended if there was any comments for what it's worth. Okay. Okay. I just think it's important for transparency yes. to know how the board voted on this issue. All right, so I'm going to go back to. When, when is the uh, when is the assembly? Uh, this one is this Saturday. This Saturday. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, if you want to go out and give up a Saturday, you can observe. Yeah. Yeah, there's only one vote. That's really the key. There's only one vote. Um, all right. So can we want to propose a resolution to deal with far, far more of our votes? Okay. All right. <coughs> there are eleven. Yes. All right, the first proposed resolution that ultimately is here. Can I let us read this? this pro I'll read the proposed resolution. The New Ham uh, this is submitted by Boise River Co-op School Board. The New Hampshire School Board's Association supports legislation that makes clear the authority of local school districts to district all that authorized police and security officers, officers from bringing firearms onto school property. This restriction applies to all students, school visitors, employees, volunteers, those attend school functions, and those voting in land politics and its um, So ultimately, the point being here is this was there was an offer. Voice the River is making a recommendation to go ahead and allow guns off campus. Yes, Alessio, can I ask a quick question? Uh, uh, Mr. Alessio, you, you had said that the continuing resolutions would be, they, they've been in place before. Yeah. But they started out this way, exactly. from a school district. No, right. I, no, I wanted to clarify for the public how this occurs, okay. because the, um, Dr. Brown had mentioned at the last board meeting some of the political interlays of the NHSBA, and I feel that it needs to be clear to the public that they act on what their delegates ask them to do. Because I did call them to clarify that. Yeah. But this one here is going to be a very interesting discussion yes. because it, each board is going to want to do something on their own level. Well, and they may, they may, it may get voted down. It, it's, it's been on the docket multiple years in a row, and the language just keeps changing by a different submitting school or the same submitting school. I'll tell you, in 2017, Waste River submitted this one as well. What's wrong? Okay. So, right, you are 100% correct, Superintendent, that a, a governing board like ours would create a proposed resolution. We provide our rationale behind it, and then ultimately the NHSBA goes ahead and either opposes, supports, or opposes, and they put their reasons why. Well, the, the members of the NHSBA community. And then the NHSBA has to solve no, this. Let the brief take us back. The NHSBA executive committee yep. reviews them, and they, as a elect, they as a body, come forth thank and do it. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And then ultimately, you know, obviously their director, Sarah Christina, yep. goes ahead and champions that conversation with the board of directors. They come up with, well, what does the NHSBA support? And let's remind ourselves, the NHSBA's executive committee is made up of governing board members of the members. Okay. So, for example, SAU 16, the chair of SAU 16 is also currently the chair of 
than just VAs. They're good. Okay, thank you. So that they're governing board members just like us. Okay. So they have proposed, so they oppose this. They oppose the idea of having firearms um, allowed in the school. Um, Except for authorized police. Exactly. Right, correct. Right. So your governing board went ahead and um, it's 50 50 on this one. So we, we didn't get one response. Uh, one response came through. Let me know. Let's see what she's saying. Um, this question. How did we not get one response to that? So this obviously does require conversation, which is interesting. Oppose, oppose, support, oppose, oppose. So it's one, two, three. Who did not say submit? Ellie, you're the you're the deciding vote. For some reason. I'm the deciding vote. Yeah. Why did you Why did you vote for that? For some reason to come through. Well, that's an interesting question. I'm uh, sorry, that's what you don't want to I think I supported it because I do feel that the police should be able to come in armed. I don't feel that we should ask them to leave the weapons out. Because it's not going to it's not going to change if, if we have an incident in the schools, God help us. Not, so you, right. so are, are I hearing correctly that those other three board members are okay with a student member walking into school with a gun in the pocket. I mean, that's the way Texas does it, apparently, with a five inch samurai sword. You kick it out of a gun in one pocket and another kick it out of a machete. That's what they did. That helped us out. Wow. So. I think that's the, uh, it's a little presumptuous where it says, on the other hand, school boards and administration have the responsibility of maintaining an environment free of hazardous conditions, quote unquote. Um, it depends on if someone has the right to carry and they are, for example, again, a police officer. The hazardous condi conditions may be exacerbated when it's a gun free zone. You don't have qualified people who have a permit to carry, allowed to carry, exercise that right. So, you're running the public carry in the state, though. Concealed carry? No. Well, well if you have a police officer, for example. I know in Massachusetts the statute reads whoever not being a police officer carry the bond of person. Right. So, I don't know what the statute is here, but, but I'm sure there must be something in the statute like they have in Massachusetts that whoever not being a police officer. Uh, so, so can I just say that, that having been, a, I'm just going to briefly comment from the Superintendents Association. Having been at the NHSAA for many conversations about this topic, it, the group is relatively unanimous that we do not support weapons on school grounds unless it's a certified police officer. And that's what this resolution is saying. If you oppose this resolution, you're saying that you're okay with the kids bringing the guns and they have to write that. And that, that is something that, that I just wanted you to hear from me that our organization, the administrators, and the principals in the NEA feel very strongly that this is a major concern. So I, I just wanted you to understand. I, when I first read this, it was a little confusing. So I'm saying this for clarification purposes, not to persuade anyone to vote a certain way. I'm saying that, that what this resolution says is that the NHSBA is concerned about people bring buying firearms on campuses. And honestly, with the level of tension with teenage kids and the way that things can escalate, I don't worry about their you fists. Little the kids, I think they're being a long range and they bring it, they see it, trying to I have, yeah, We don't want that. Right, we do not like want guns on, I do not want guns on our school property. How do we handle that? If it's a local decision or a state decision, I'm fine with what I'm going to hear my recommendation as the superintendent on this matter. Technically speaking, it's a 14 vote. It's one time for the number. Okay, thank you. Um, Ellie, your results didn't come through for number two, but they're all there for the continued resolutions as well. Um, number two, proposed resolution is, let me read that. All right, submitted by Manchester School Board of School Committee. Eliminate removing the two existing New Hampshire School Board Association resolutions relative to the New Hampshire retirement system, which is part of those continued resolutions prior that we were in the other one. Yeah. The New Hampshire School Board, support, School Board Association supports the continuing existence of the New Hampshire School uh, retirement system. So again, they're con 
stating again the obvious that they're continuing that support here. Um, the rationale by New Hampshire, um, the rationale is the Senior Commission has established a long-term plan for fully funding the New Hampshire retirement system. All stakeholders, have, all stakeholders have had an opportunity to voice their opinion to the commission and make recommendations. The New Hampshire School Board Association Executive Committee, Committee recommends supporting this. The New Hampshire School Board of Directors believes that eliminating these two resolutions will better reflect the association's position with respect to recent actions of the New Hampshire retirement system. So additionally, the New Hampshire School Board Association Board Directors believes that the challenges facing local school boards will, with respect to NHRS funding relate primarily to the elimination of state contributions to the NHRS, which were cut back in 2009 and fully eliminated in fiscal year 2013. Furthermore, the New Hampshire School Board Association's proposed alternative here is to support the continuing existence of the New Hampshire retirement system the New Hampshire retirement system should be strong, secure. So, it's, so ultimately, our governing board went ahead and voted 50-50. Ellie, I, I apologize. You must have not clicked past these. I saw. I know you obviously initialed them. But I did vote. I, I actually, I, I guess I'm opposed because I think the employees should contribute to their retirement. Well, it makes sense because that, that couples your other vote that you did in the other one. Yes. Okay, so that's a 4-3 vote for opposed, for what's worth. Additional feedback that was by your, the board. Um, and I mean, you, by all means, those who put this feedback in, they can read for themselves or indicate what they want to say. Um, an increase in rates should be shared by employer, employee, and state. If resolution two is, um, so Dr. Brown, you said, I support yes, but New Hampshire School Board's alternative all proposal, I'm opposed to no which makes sense. Um, rather than, the t again, this is continuing the conversation from the continued resolution. Uh, please don't, I don't support this, rather than taxpayers supporting defined benefit pensions, et cetera, as stated in the continued resolution. Yes, Mr. Baker? Another comment is that I love how they say employer and state. Yes, I agree. When it should be taxpayer and employee, because it comes out of the just one pocket or the other, but it's still the taxpayer playing it, paying it. So recognize, I will be going to the, I will be going to the delegate assembly and saying opposed here, just so we know. Yep. Okay. Even though it's recommended by the school board association. All right. Rationale number, uh, proposed resolution number three. Merrimack Valley School Board submitted this. The New Hampshire School Board advocates for the proper funding of <clears throat> the proposed resolution. New Hampshire School Board Association advocates for the proper funding of high quality public education and opposes any provisions of the law or rule that funds private school student reassignment using public raised, publicly raised tax dollars. The rationale here is Senate Bill 193, or RSA 193, colon 3, and Ed Reform 320 rules representing potential areas where school choice proponents can divert publicly raised funds in the case of school reassignment. The NHSBA should oppose any such efforts. The NHSBA does not support this. It's not recommended. Greatly, um, they appreciate the Merrimack Valley School Board submission and interest in this matter. However, the New Hampshire School Board Association's board directors believe that the subject matter and intent of this proposal is already covered in Resolution 1A and 1B. Adoption of the resolution should be duplicate and repetitive. This is really a, you know, they're just trying to say, let's not muddy the waters here. Your governing board had voted. Um, it might have been confusing for some, but it was a in support and opposed. So it's kind of interesting here that our governing board actually said they support this versus opposing it, which again is in contrast to what the school board association is indicating. So the reason for feedback here: no public funds for private schools. The only exception would be if private schools also provide special education. Did those read this in backwards by chance? Well, I saw it as that we was, were not putting any public funds to private schools. I'm the yep. one that wrote that comment I about saw that. the special, and I did that in a couple places. Yep. Because if you're really going to, if you really want to level the playing field, then with, then the private schools have to take special needs kids. Right. Have to. We cannot leave special needs kids in the public sector and not fully funded. You cannot do that. 
So, so why should we be giving money to private schools if they're not taking special needs children? So well, that, that would be the leveling field so that a parent could take their child to any school as long as that school also took the same proportion of special needs children as the sending district. Did, did, did our board vote backwards in this, just out of curiosity? Did we vote that we want to support it or we want to oppose these opposers? I, I really do question that. So if you support it, you're, you're against public funds to private schools. Yes. That's how I voted. OK, I just want to make sure. OK. I've got a question, Corey. Yeah. When you present the results, are you going to present so many for, so many against? Are you going to? We can do that, sure. Yes. OK. Yeah, yeah the data is there not to be manipulated. Yeah, it's just because a that's a little bit more accurate than just saying, well, the majority was for it or against it. Well, I will just. For clarification, for clarification purposes, when you say present, that's only being presented in any publication that we're putting out there. That's not a conversation to go forward. No, but when um, you're at the when, when you're a delegate at the assembly, you're raising a yay or a nay. Oh, I see. Okay. So it we're, we're voting on yay. You no. want a yay or nay? This because it is. It was confusing for me too when I read it. So it has to be a nay then, right? Uh, well, yeah, I think that's the question. Is I think you guys should do a straight up down vote right now on this one because it's confusing. I agree. So, uh, Pete, could you have a motion? Uh, I, I move that um, we not support uh, public, fun pri public funding for private schools. Second. Oh, well, I'll propose resolution number three. Yeah, just say proposal. Yeah. Do, okay. do we vote in favor or against a proposal? I was going to say, I think it needs a motion because we're instructing. Yeah, right. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. So, thumbs up on we don't support it. Yeah. So we're, we're instructing him not to. Yeah. I don't think we need a motion. Yeah. I think we're instructing Thumbs our representative. I thought, I thought a yes vote was run around, run around. saying that yes we don't support we don't support public funds for, for private, private schools. Right. Okay. Right. 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 If you that's what I said. We don't which support. Which means we support it. the resolution. Right. So that's a yes vote. It's a yes vote, Peter. Yes, we don't support. Okay. Right. I, it is weird, you, but yes. Yes, we What I was saying is we don't support the resolution. Yes. We support okay, the resolution because it says no public right. money for it's, private it's schools. Backwards. I think. I think. I'm opposed to the resolution. You're opposed, right, Tammy? I'm opposed to the resolution. Perfect. I like that. Okay. Okay. So, so, we're the NHS we're all in agreement. We're opposed to the resolution. Okay. All right, Tina. Uh, Larry, you're on. You're opposed. Okay. Yes. I think you. It's again backwards. Um, Proposed resolution number four, Messenic Regional School Board, very tiny community. The Messenic uh, School Board supports NHSBA Resolution 1A in that the utilization of public education funds be used solely for public school purposes as determined by the local schools. Again, this is a duplicate of the prior one, the, the advent of SB 193 and the continued advocacy for the use of public taxpayers funds to support vouchers and or provide private school interests and contrary to our belief that public education funds be used solely for support of students' public education. This is, they say there's no action needed because, as it was submitted to indicate the Messenic School Board's continued support of NHSBA's 1A. So this is duplicate efforts um, for what's worth and our board uh, read it that way it, for what it's worth. Um, so it looks as though, again, there was you know, consistent feedback about where our money should be going. Um, any further discussion on Resolution 4? No? It's kind of being bantered about here. Resolution 5, again, res uh, submitted by Messenic Regional School Board. The Messenic School Board supports Resolution 1B, urging the New Hampshire Legislature and Congress to oppose any efforts to subsidize elementary or secondary private religious or homeschools of public tax, tax, tax dollars. I don't need to continue read, do I not going to continue reading this one? Again, the rationale is the Messina School Board supports the importance and responsibility of the New Hampshire legislation in Congress to adequately fund our country's system of public education and to maintain up-to-date funding formulas. Again, New Hampshire School Board indicated that there is no action necessary to be taken on this proposal as it was submitted to indicate the Messina School Board's continued support. So it's just reaffirmation. So our governing board had read that the same way. Again, it's a duplicate conversation. Proposed resolution number six, <clears throat> submitted by a nearby community of Raymond School Board, that if a parent chooses to exempt their student from a statewide assessment, school district, the 
does not need parental approval for the alternative activity that will be provided to the student while assessment is being administered. Very interesting. RSA 193 rationale here is RSA 193 colon C colon 6 and RSA 91-A colon 5 paragraph 3 were amended such that if a student is exempted from taking the statewide assessment by the parent or legal guardian, the school must provide an appropriate alternative education activity for the time period during which the test is administered and that the alternative activity will be agreed upon by the parent legal guardian at the school district. <coughs> the New Hampshire School Board, I'm not going to continue, the New Hampshire School Board Association opposes this and does not recommend it. Um, though they understand and respect the concerns raised with this proposal. However, the New Hampshire School Board Association Board of Directors is concerned that the proposed language may be interpreted as meaning NHSA <coughs> does not respect parental input. So they had to clarify that there. Our board, um, with resolution number six, had gone ahead and voted um, almost in, uh, voted in favor of supporting this. There are two resolutions where this should be resolved locally. Um, great comment. If resolution, and then the other one is I'm opposed and you don't agree with. So again, it should be a local control is what we're reading here. Um, but I will be going and saying we support the NHSBA's recommendation. This is backwards again. The, the majority of right. those? We're yes. We're agreeing with the uh, You're agreeing with the NHSBA. Everyone opposed doesn't want that resolution. Either. Yep, yep. Okay, okay, number seven, sorry. We got a split vote here, Ellie, this is you again. It didn't like my, I put it's, those numbers in. It that's funny. Didn't like Raymond School <laughs> Board, the public funding not to be used for support religious or private education. This is the same one we've already discussed. Um, so I, we are obviously. I, in, I agree. Okay, Re resolution number not eight, <clears throat> submitted by the Raymond School Board, that the decision is that, this, that the decision as to what date to start school year remains a local decision and not be mandated by the state government. Absolutely. There has been discussion in the state government about the possibility of mandating that the first of school for all New Hampshire public school be after Labor Day each year. While we're not necessarily opposed to this, we feel that it should be a decision made locally, not mandated by the state. The New Hampshire <laughs> Board of Directors recommends that greatly appreciates Raymond School Board's submission and interest in this matter. However, the New Hampshire School Board Association Board of Directors believes that the subject matter and intent of this proposal is already governed underneath Resolution 5, colon, I. The adopting of this resolution would be duplicative and repetitive. So the point being here is the New Hampshire School Board Association doesn't want this to go into effect because it's actually another resolution that they'll have to be maintained for clarification purposes. So they support local control over the date. Our governing board here was basically unanimous as well. Okay, resolution number nine. Um, and there was, uh, okay, number nine, let's see here. Keene School Board, the New Hampshire School Board Association supports continuing to allow school districts to determine the best opening school date for their own districts. Another similar conversation. As indicated, they opposed us based upon the same exact reason. Our governing board um, voted the same way for its worth. Resolution 10, almost two more here, guys. It's submitted again by Keene School Board. The New Hampshire School Board supports legislation allowing local districts to determine whether guns are allowed in their school. Another conversation about the rationale by Keene is local school districts and superintendents work closely and intensely with local and state safety and law enforcement personnel to develop individualized school safety plans designed for individual buildings and committees. The local officials should retain control over what weapon policies best kept their own students and buildings safe. I have to admit, I like the way Keene worded this uh, compared to the other one. Um, New Hampshire boards. They oppose us, as indicated beforehand by the Oyster River. So we are, in this case, interestingly enough, we're not in support of this. We're in support of this as well, right? So again, let's make sure we're on the same page here. Are we for guns or not? It's basically the same conversation. Well, we're for local, local control. Local so control. it's a 4-3 vote in this one still, right? Just to keep continuity. 
Um, although I have to admit, I like the way they wrote this, and based upon the language, I would, I can, you know, I, this is a much better language, but I don't want kids and guns in schools. My own opinion, sorry. Number 11. Last but not least, Litchfield School Board, approved by Litchfield School Board on November 5th, 2018. The New Hampshire School Board supports the ratif modifying of RSA 193 colon 3, number, uh, paragraph I, to require the New Hampshire School Board of Education restore support for local decision in the change of school assignments and manifest education hardship request. Mouthful. The rationale here is the support for the State School Board of Education for local decision in case of manifest education, educational hardship would restore authority to local school boards and enable local school boards to render better decisions which are in the best interest of the child. Local school boards better understand the situation under which a parent guardian requests a manifest education hardship hardship decision for their child. Local school boards are in the better position to determine if there is a clear and convincing evidence to approve this type of request. NHSBA said, well, we'll time out here. There's really no action that's needed here because this proposed resolution was submitted after Friday, November 2nd, 2018. That's why we see the date up there, by the way. For this reason and to maintain consistency and fairness, the NHSBA Board of Directors is declined to make any recommendation on this proposed resolution. So in this case, so we all know, the NHS, this will go to vote on the floor. Just so you know, even though the NHSBA doesn't support it. Uh, actually, no, it will not be voted on the floor because it was submitted late. Just so you know. Sorry about that. But it says that they can, it, the Litchfield School Board may introduce the proposal from the floor. They could. Or they may, there should, could still be a vote, right? Right. There could still be a vote. But ultimately, it could also not be second. And they can't second themselves. Just say. So what did, did we vote on this one? Yes, we did. Yes. Yeah. Yep. We support and recommend if resolution, um, I support this resolution. So we voted in support of this, so you know. So I would make a motion that if they introduce it and there isn't a second, that you make a second. No. Oh. Oh, yeah. So. OK. Is there a second from Jim's motion? I nope. second that. Yes, sure. No need to. We've already voted in favor of it. Yeah. OK. Understood. But, but what, what you're saying so is you want me to second it? Okay. He wants you to second it. Uh, I'll second the I'll second the motion, Jim. Okay. So can I? This board is instructing him to second it. Yes, sir. If there is no second. Yeah. I will. I'll second that motion. I, I I want to wrap this up, but I want to make one quick comment. This is a very important issue for superintendents, and I'll tell you why. When when you make the decision to when when we have a discipline problem and it comes to you as a board and you make the decision to uphold the discipline, what's happening is that there's been a problem where pe parents are going to the State Board of Education and they are being very, they are overturning local school boards a lot and spending your tax dollars sending kids to other school districts. And that's a very deep concern because you have to understand that when a student goes to another district, it takes about approximately $20,000 out of our budget. We don't cut anything for that. Right? So 20 grand roughly goes with that kid to a different school district if this the board of education is spending your tax dollars when they overturn your decision in one of those discipline situations. A manifest hardship hearing is when a parent is coming to you as a school board and saying to you, "My child cannot receive a fair education at Sanborn Regional School District because of X, Y, and Z." If they don't prove their case and you don't agree with them, they have the right to appeal to the State Board of Education. If the State Board of Education hears their appeal and overturns your decision as a school board, we have to pay for them to go to another district. No, and they're overturned, they never used to, but now they're overturning them left and right. So I just want you to know that that's an important issue for you as taxpayers to maintain local control in your communities. There you go. Ridiculous. Okay, right, that's moving on. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Corey. I, will, I will give Phyllis and Mr. Breyer a summary in the top form. So, Peter, before you go, I want to give the update for the amounts. Okay. Um, I'll report out. I'll report out the next board meeting the results. Thank you, Corey. I, th I, I, I thought this was a great discussion. It hasn't happened since I've been on the board. This is the first time in five years, so I appreciate that. I was it's it's really, yeah, really glad to uh, take part in it. Sorry, challenge us to come up with a resolution next year. Okay. Hey, 
Um, next one, deliberate session warrant articles. I've talked to you all individual, but I just want to put it on the record. Um, please be brief when you do this on the deliberate session. All right. And um, if just Madam Moderator, if you make sure I've got this correctly, the moderator will read the warrant article. Um, the budget on this first one, the budget committee will present the budget. And then Larry, last Thursday night, you presented the default. So if you could present the default that night, you just raise your hand, the moderator will turn to you and recognize you when you just do your thing. Okay, the next four, Jim, I know there's four, but you were on the collective bargaining um, committee and you presented last Thursday night, so I stuck it to you with four. If you could do the collective bargaining agreement, and then the next one, which is a special meeting, and then the collective bargaining for the support staff, and then the collective bargain and the and the special meeting for the support staff. So I know there's four, but there's two. But there's I've already told you that I'm going to waive my involvement and let you have a, a, a part well, participation. you have experience, and experience counts a lot. I just don't want you to feel left out because no, I, I don't okay. notice that you're taking no, any of these no. personally. He talks to the last you. thing Ellie wants. <laughs> last thing Ellie wants is me talking more. What did I just say to you, Jim? He talks too much. <laughs> See. Okay, Ellie and I so go back, I don't know how many years. Oh so I think I arrested her at BU once. The agreements, no, and what were the other two? I never got arrested. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be the, mm -hmm. the collective bargaining for both of them, support and the uh, yeah. special arrest. Yeah. And those two articles that if we need, uh, you oh, know, yeah. right, okay. But that's not to preclude anyone else from you know, responding to the question. Or oh, anybody else can talk on these, right, absolutely. But, but, you, but you have the initial res right, response right. But, or yeah. support. So okay. when Rick reads it, you'll be able to say, Mr. Moderator, and you give a little something to the people. Um, and I was going to say this at the end, but if anybody needs support on these assignments, uh, the superintendent has already said he will, whatever you need, if you want handouts or whatever, whatever. Uh, and again, be brief, right, Ellie? Salvation Army type handout? Okay. Yeah, okay. What do you consider brief in your world? Three sentences. To, to the point. Okay. <laughs> the facts, the f <laughs> and only the facts. Okay. I think that was with Sergeant Friday. So. I always tell people, Jim, if it's more than three sentences, it's not going in an email, I'll call you. All right. Okay. I'll help you out. Ellie, if you could do the um, articles of agreement. Yep. And then I just went up the road, so um, Tammy, you happen to be next in line, so you got the 75000 is that okay? No. Okay, and the superintendent will help you with that. Pam, if you could give the uh, 25000 if you notice I'm kind of going up the road here. Corey, you seem to be... Um, passionate. Uh, passionate, that. okay, all right, about <laughs> hockey. Um, I'm sure somebody on the floor will mention it, but... If you feel you want to jump in or if you want to do it first, fine. You just ask the moderator to recognize you and you can present. Well, can I just. The, I will read the Warren article, but if. No, the, the, no, the moderator will read the Warren article. Moderator yeah, so, yeah. so then I and can. The petitioner should but speak that's a petition first. Warren article. Is it appropriate but, for the board to present that? No, yes no. and no, it depends. That's but I wanted to. I assigned way, everyone, so the rule of order would be that the moderator would recognize the petitioner okay, first. Okay. Okay. And then the board should then speak okay, up. So and you support may not it. have to. Right. Well, I mean, because ultimately the moderator will say that the board voted as such. Right. Correct. Right. So it Correct. may not be necessary, but if so, I can be a person who speaks. And Rick board. knows to look for the petition. The petitioner has the first right to support the article on the petition when I go. So I'll be on notice, sir. Is the point. Yes, I didn't want to leave you. Up. It would be thank you. As I'm a school here, board member, I, I would like you to support it because I think it's important for the public to know that we did support the article. Yes, I agree. Well, did we support the article? We did. We did. Well, I thought it was four to two. It was four to two. So that's, that's and you're only reporting what you what what we voted. Yeah, but yeah. the majority voted. It was, right. and they could yeah. see what the numbers were. The public right. could see it's that. It's going to be so. there, you know. But okay. I, May so, I ask a question about, just in case Corey asked me for guidance, I just, on this one, if Corey is planning to speak on it, I would advise him to say, the reason why the board voted in favor of this was because it was very clear in this particular version, year three, that the funds will be used to cover non-ice time expenses. Yeah, that's going to be key. And that would be an important thing for Corey to say in why the board voted for it. I'll go back to the recording of this video. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank okay. you. All right. Yeah, and, and, and again, if, if, if he doesn't say that or leave some up, and we feel it's important to say something, you've got the right to say. I 
fail to see the significance of that. Um, it's just one piece of the total. They're still asking for uniforms, coaches, and transportation. And that's going to grow. And a year from now or two years from now, they could be asking for ice time. So I don't, I don't get the... Well, they would have to have a separate warrant article to ask for ice time. No, I understand that. Yeah, I just... But I don't get the significance of why we approved this because they didn't ask for ice time. Because the ice time caught is what the, the, the if we had approved ice time, it would have been almost $30,000. We, we approved 10000 out of twenty five. So you didn't talk to him. That's all. Yeah. That's my question. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is that I was trying to summarize that this is why I brought it up, and I'm glad you're yeah. speaking about it, Jim, because I didn't want to direct Corey in, a, in, an, in, <clears throat> in an inappropriate or, or uncomfortable way, but my sense of the summary of the discussion about this Warren article was that the board voted in favor of it because it did. It, it, it was very specific. That was important to me. It, yeah, it kind of that took it on did a, not include ice time. And it, if that's not true, speak now or forever hold your peace. It kind of took thing, on you know? a life of its own as being significant, and I didn't see the significance when it first came up, but it was sort of jumped on as a reason to approve it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I've been public, and I'll be transparent yeah. that I support this Warren article because it includes that. I did not support it last That's year personally. Me. Last year I voted against yeah, it. Yeah, I, 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 I needed that clarity that it did not include ice time because the ice time is very expensive. So, so it's important to say, it's, and Ellie, please correct me if I'm wrong here, the majority of the board voted in favor of, and here is why. And, and, and well, that's, did, that's, I don't want to say why, because we all have a different individual reason why. Well, well for the support, I think reason. he's correct. I think that's why I'm I asking Corey just framed my question. Right. And, and the reason being is because, quite frankly, as you indicated, it's come to the table multiple times. And, and so the, why did we support it this time when we had it in that's the That's exactly what I'm trying to yeah. tease out here. Yep. I think that's important to bring that's up, because right. I think that's the case. All right, and again, I have, uh, you've got assistance if you need it, and the last thing I say is be a brief. Okay, any questions about these warrant articles? Because we should, in my opinion, have a unified, you know, I may not agree with what you say, but I'll defend to the death you right to say it. I would like to, I would, I would like, as your chair, to have a unified, even though in here we'll beat each other over the head. Um, your choice to do that. I gave. I given my spiel. Whatever you think is appropriate. Let's move on here. We have got public comment number two. Right on time. Pardon? Look at eight thirty. Eight thirty. Well, I'm trying to get us out here, but Ellie kept talking about those other things. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was interesting. When you point a finger at me, Ellie, there's three pointing back at you. Okay. Don't even go there, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there we go, Cheryl. Thank you. By my math, I had a discussion. What do you got? No, go ahead. <laughs> Cheryl Gannon from Kingston. I just wanted to express my disappointment at the turnout at the public hearing for the budget. Um, I hear. I read on social media, people concerned about taxes, where's the money going? And here is their opportunity to present their opinions, to ask the questions. It's a public hearing. That's the sole purpose, is to let you know how your tax dollars are being spent in this school district. There were maybe 10 people there some of whom were associated with the school, kind of expected to be there. Maybe some teachers, school board members were there. But members of the public, it was just, in my opinion, a pathetic turnout. I don't know why. I hope that in the future we can have a better turnout because when these issues go to the polls, I feel that people don't fully understand what they're voting for. This, this is part of our de democracy. This is where you get to speak, to let your voice be heard. And nobody showed up. Perhaps next year we can have a better, uh, a more intense uh, publicity about this. 
and get people off of their computers and in there so that their voices can be heard. Because what's said at that public hearing can have an impact on what budget is presented. The budget committee is supposed to consider what was presented at that hearing and take those opinions into consideration. So just my plug for please come out and be a part of your democracy. Okay. Other public? Phyllis? Um, agenda? Yeah, I think we only had the one thing. I didn't write any down. Sorry. Okay. Okay, the next San Bones Regional School Board meeting will be held Wednesday, February 6th, 2019, from 6 to 7 p.m. in room 137 at the high school. Immediately following the meeting, the first voting session, deliberative session, will be held at 7 p.m. in the auditorium at the Sanborn Regional High School. Snow date is February 7th. Cheryl picked it a scab for me. Thank you, Cheryl, by the way. You, ladies and gentlemen, determine the taxes in this town. Not the school board, not the selectmen. You do. The deliberative session gives you the opportunity to stand up and say, I make a motion too. If it is seconded, it is then discussed and voted on. So when you complain about the taxes, if you don't go to the deliberative session, please don't complain to me. Filing period position to Sanborn Regional School Board for the Sanborn Regional Budget Committee and the district moderator will be open Wednesday, that's today, February 23rd, 2019, and end Friday, February 1, 2019, at 5 p.m. The candidate filing forms may be obtained at the SAU from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. The school district clerk, that is you, Phyllis, am I correct? When you walk in the office, third desk on the left, will be available on the last day to file from 5 p.m. at the S SAU office located on the second floor of the San Boy Regional High School second day. Okay, I'm sorry. File from until. I think we got a little typo there, I think. It says five from to file from. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna read it again because that from threw me off. Sam okay, Wednesday, twenty third, February 1, 9, 2019, for at 5 p.m. Candidate filing forms will be obtained at the SAU office 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. The school district clerk will be available on the last day to file until 5 p.m. <coughs> at the SAU office located on the second floor of the Sanborn Regional High School, 17 Danville Road. If you are interested in one of these positions, you come down, see Phyllis, she'll give you the form, you fill it out, you're good to go. Is there a fee or anything? No fee. So. Come in and do it. Second voting session for the annual school board district meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 12, 2019, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in the Swayze Gymnasium, Sanborn Seminary Campus, for, for, for Kingston voters and in the Newton Town Hall for the Newton voters. And just to clarify, Ellie, you've already said this, you will not be the moderator there, am I correct, at the election? Yes, I will. Why wouldn't I be? Well, because you're running for position. Okay, no, I don't care. Okay, no, that's it okay. Depends on whether or not this opposition. I don't know. There's I mean, a conflict. Yeah. No, that's fine. No, I don't think it's a conflict. Okay, no. all right, okay, because you know somebody's going to be asking that. You know, I did. <clears throat> that's two different districts, and they're separate. Yeah, no, I just wanted to clarify it because <laughs> I got a little experience of people saying, "How come you're not doing this, Pete?" Okay, non-public <laughs> session. We don't have any. <clears throat> We don't. No, but we did. So no, 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 it's there as a place. So there. it is only eight thirty. So Thanks. anything Jesus. anybody want to bring? Oh, no, wait a minute. Don't put it back up. Corey, my term is up. Me, and Allie, Allie, because she was appointed and she's got, she took Taryn's position. Taryn's up next, I think next year, yes. but. She has to run for the one year. I would be running for the one year position. Are you rerunning? I'm going to run for that one. I don't think so, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> don't open that can of worms right now. <laughs> We're all ready to go home. <laughs> I said it, everyone. Is, uh, the private I is, 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 yeah. but, but there's equally important there are positions up on the budget committee. 
Am I correct in that? Yes, there are three sir. positions. There are. One Kingston, one Newton, one at large? Yep. Yes. That's equal. And if anyone's thinking about school board down the road, a budget position would be an excellent way to learn about the system. I highly recommend that. I was on the budget committee before I was a selectman. Um, and I strongly recommend, if you're considering getting into politics, it's a great way to start learning. Absolutely. That's what happened here? Hmm? <laughs> Anybody else you want to discuss it? Adam, what do you got? Anything? You mean we got to go home? Motion for adjournment. So move. <laughs> I'm doing that just for her. All in favor. Uh, I think it's unanimous. <laughs> 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 <laughs>